make sure she has co-host. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board meeting of Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. And at this time, in accordance with the California Government Code, Section 54953E, in consideration of the coronavirus, members of the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board of Directors and staff have the option to participate in this meeting by teleconferencing. Members of the public may wish to also to attend the meeting in person or observe electronically. Uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hand um, at the appropriate time if members from the public would like to comment. Uh, any matter on the agenda, speakers are customarily limited to three minutes each. However, the board chair may increase or decrease the allotted time to each speaker based on the number of speakers and the length of the agenda and the complexity of the subject matter. Speaking time will not be decreased to less than one minute. At this time, uh, may we call the meeting to order and have a roll call. Yes, thank you. I will begin with those members participating in person. We'll start with Chair Gibbons. Here. Vice Chair Tyson. Here. Director Willie. Here. Director Flagger. Here. Director Klein. Present. Thank you. Director not Hilton. Not improved. <laughs> right, Here. correct. Thank you. Director Rennie. Here. Director Elahi. Here. Martinez Beltran. Here. Abe Koga. Here. Walia. Here. Lee. Present. Thank you. And I will note that currently we have Director Chua absent, but we do have a quorum of the board. Thank you very much. At this time, we are going to begin the meeting with uh, a special uh, opportunity to say thank you. Um, it is with pleasure, tinged with some sadness, that uh, the board, current and past members of the board, um, are here to have a resolution thanking George Stepanovich on, uh, for his contributions to the, uh, from the very beginning of Silicon Valley Clean Energy and leaving us in wonderful hands with Trish Ortiz. So the resolution number 2022-17, the Board of Directors of Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority hereby resolves as follows. Whereas the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority, SVCEA, was formed on March 31, 2016, with the 11 cities and towns and the County of Santa Clara deciding to become an initial member. And whereas George Stepanovich, I'm sorry, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, apologies, <laughs> Greg, uh, played an important role in the first general counsel of the authority. And whereas Greg Stepanovich, Stepanovich, I think is how you say it, I'm sorry, um, assists Silicon Valley Clean Energy Authority staff in the startup of the operation of the SVCEA, which includes preparing required filings with the Secretary of State and the State Controller, and whereas Greg prepared the first governing documents of the authority, and whereas Greg participated in approximately 80 SVCEA Board of Directors meetings, and whereas Greg provided assistance on legal, administrative, and operational matters for SVCEA, in which um, reduced community emissions by 35% from the 2015 baseline and saved customers an aggregate $77 million on on-bill savings, and whereas Greg supported the legal and operational matters for the community funds that annually grant $100,000 to local organizations, $75,000 to nonprofits, and $70,000 in educational scholarships. Now, therefore, the Board of Directors of SVCEA hereby commend General Counsel Greg Stepanovich and expresses its sincere appreciation for his dedicated service to Silicon Valley Clean Energy. 
adopted today, the 8th of June, 2022. So, Greg, you are there on the screen. Yes. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so good to see everybody. So please, we'd be delighted to, to hear from you. Well, again, it's so great to see everyone here this evening and be back at a board meeting. And uh, with my retirement, I would like to have to say a few words here to, to, the, to the board and to the staff. And I'd like to thank the board and past boards for giving me the opportunity to represent SVCE as general counsel since its inception. It was an experience that truly stands out as one of the most rewarding parts of my legal career. It was very exciting to be involved uh, at the ground level when we first began with the uh, committee meetings and, and many staff meetings and uh, meetings with the future board members uh, in drafting the formation documents. But it's been even more gratifying to see how SVCE has grown into this inspiring organization that is a, truly a model for CCAs and good government throughout the state and for that matter the country. Since the beginning, the board has been exceptional, both in how it has worked together and with staff. There has been so many challenging and novel issues that we've had to uh, work on and deal with. And it's been a great pleasure working with such a dedicated and talented staff. And I have to say there is an energy here that I believe drives everyone to want to excel. I also, at this point, want to thank my partner, Trish Ortiz, who, uh, for doing an outstanding job and stepping into my shoes as general counsel when I went on medical leave. And I'm really grateful for the work that uh, Trisha did, and I know that she will continue to do an outstanding job uh, for the uh, agency in the future. So again, thanks so much for having this chance uh, to see you again tonight and to have served for these last several years. Oh, thank you so much, Greg. Um, I don't know if others have anything to, to offer, but um, your presence, your steady comments and leadership and, and just responsiveness and helping us feel good as a board that we knew what we were doing and covering our bases legally was immeasurable. And, and I, I wish you the very best, but I, I do and will always uh, appreciate what you have brought to this, this agency. I see um, Director Abikoga. Thank you, Chair. I just want to offer my um, deepest gratitude to Greg for all of your um, dedication and your your guidance um, throughout this uh, the, and from the inception to to this day. Um, you 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 precede me on, on the board. <laughs> um, but it, you know, given that you know it's a, been a, it's a new organization okay. and there's a lot of um, uncertainty, so it's just been really um, great to have you there to provide us your sage guidance and legal advice and, and keep us on the, the straight and narrow track. And so um, I just want to say thank you so much. I really have enjoyed working with you. I, I appreciate your your demeanor and your enthusiasm and, and your responsiveness and um, we'll definitely miss you. Um, but I hope that you'll uh, keep in touch with us and best wishes on your um, next chapter in life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Director, our uh, CEO, uh, Balachandran. Thank you, Chair Gibbons. Uh, Greg, it's been such a pleasure working with you. Uh, I'll try and keep this short. You are a general counsel and you really gave us counsel and it was council uh, really centered with integrity and responsiveness. Uh, you serve the public very well with the integrity that you show, and you serve staff very well with the responsiveness that you show. And in addition to that, just for free, a dose of humor too. <laughs> so that was awesome. And I wish you all the best in improving your golf game. And I look forward to joining you on the links one of these days. So, Greg, we're really going to miss you. And thank you very much for all the service you've provided SVCE. And also, Garish, I'd just like to add, it's been such a pleasure working with you. And I tell you, you're the best in the business. And I really have been fortunate to have a chance to have worked with you over these uh, several years. Well, thank you all. And thank you again, Greg. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I look forward to seeing everything that's going to be accomplished by, by SBC in the future. Yeah, thank you. Well done. 
And with that uh, really uh, great appreciation, we will move on to the agenda. And I think uh, we all have a fairly significant agenda this evening, and we will try and move it along uh, appropriately. Chair, this is uh, an item for action. We would like to adopt a resolution commending Greg for his service. I uh, thank you for that. So may we have a roll call vote, please? And I'll make the motion. Okay. And I'll second it. Thank, thank you. you. Great, thank you. And this is to adopt resolution 2022-17. Chair Gibbons? Aye. Vice Chair Tyson? Yes. Director Willie? Yes. Flieger? Yes. Klein? Yes. Hilton? Aye. Rennie? Aye. Chua? Aye. Ilahi? Aye. Martinez Beltran? Yes. Abe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. And thank you, Madam Secretary, for getting that done correctly. So we will now move on to the regular agenda. And just for everyone's knowledge, it is a, a, a long agenda, and we will move along um, as expeditiously as possible. We will also take a break sometime around 8.30 or 9. And then we have two closed sessions. Actually, we have one closed session and one special meeting. So we will um, take a break for the closed session and convene um, in uh, private and then come back and uh, announce any action if necessary taken at the closed session and close out the regular meeting and then we will move on to the um, special meeting and everyone has instructions on how to transition from the meetings if you have any questions i know staff can help with that <coughs> excuse me so with that, we will begin the public comment on matters not listed on the agenda. The public may provide comment on any matter not listed on the agenda, provided that it is within the subject matter or jurisdiction of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. <coughs> sorry. Speakers are customarily limited to three minutes. However, <coughs> I'm sorry, I need some water. <coughs> um, let me pick up here. Uh, speakers are customarily limited to three minutes each. However, the board chair may increase or decrease the time allotted for each speaker based on the number of speakers, the length of the time allotted, um, and um, the complexity of the subject matter. Uh, speaking time will not be decreased to less than one minute. Do we have any? <coughs> Thank you. Do we have any requests from uh, speakers on non-agendized items? I see none, Madam Clerk. Uh, no, Chair, none received. Okay, thank you. We will now move to the consent calendar. Um, we have items uh, 1A through 1M. Uh, if we have a motion, we will then take public comment and then come back to uh, the board. May we have a um, motion to approve the consent calendar? I move that we adopt and approve the uh, consent calendar. Thank you. Second by Klein. Second by uh, first Klein. A motion made uh -huh. by um, Director uh, Flygor and seconded by Director uh, uh, Klein. And uh, do we have any public comment on the consent items? Seeing none. We will close the public comment period. And um, if there's any discussion by the board, if not, we will have, I see no hands raised, we will have uh, a roll call vote, please. Thank you. Chair Gibbons? Aye. Vice Chair Tyson? Yes. Willie? Yes. Flieger? Yes. Klein? Yes. Hilton? Aye. Rennie? Aye. Chua? Aye. Elahi? Aye. Martinez Beltran? Yes. Abe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. We will now go to the regular calendar. Item two is the CEO report, which is a discussion item from CEO Belachandran. Thank you, Chair Gibbons. It, uh, one of the great parts of my job is to introduce new employees. And we'll start off. We have three new employees we'd like to introduce to you. Uh, first is Raul Hernandez a senior marketing specialist who will be working in PAMS Group. Raul, would you please introduce yourself? 
Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Raul. Uh, I'm the new senior marketing specialist here at Silicon Valley Clean Energy. And my role moving forward will be to create, implement, and track our marketing strategies. Um, a little bit about myself prior to joining SPCE, um, uh, I was a senior public information representative with the City of San Jose's Environmental Services Department, where I led uh, marketing and outreach strategies for uh, the Recycle Right program. Uh, and prior to that, I was also with the Community Energy Department, known as San Jose Clean Energy, uh, in a marketing role as well uh, during the launch phase. Um, so yeah, during my brief time working uh, with San Jose Clean Energy, uh, obviously I fell in love with the energy sector. Um, there's so much excitement and passion around this industry, and it's just something that I, I truly love and enjoy. And obviously helping others is, is very important to me and uh, working for Silicon Valley Clean Energy gives me that opportunity. So um, I was born and raised here in uh, San Jose, California. I received my undergrad from Santa Clara University and uh, I'll be receiving my master's from uh, SJSU this fall. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a proud parent of two boys, uh, four and two year olds. So working in this industry is something that uh, I'm truly passionate about, especially for their future. So pleasure to meet everyone. And I look forward to uh, uh, using my skills to help advance the goals and mission of uh, SVCE. So pleasure. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up is Owen Milligan, who has graduated from being an intern for us while he was completing his senior year in business in Southern California. He has joined Monica's group as an associate power analyst. Owen, would you please introduce yourself? Of course, thank you, Garish. Good evening. Excited to be here joining now full time, uh, as Garish said. So I have served as a year, over a year as a power resources intern. In that time, I was assisting with modeling, and I will continue to do that as well as support power resources in front office transactions, of course, the portfolio. I did graduate just over a month ago now from Concordia University, Irvine. I completed a bachelor's in business administration with an emphasis in both finance and data analytics and a minor in communication. Um, so quite the background uh, for just a, a couple of years there at Concordia, but I was excited to finish undergrad as well as join here full time now. I've been you know, blessed by SBCE to work as an intern and even more excited to continue with the organization, learn more about the uh, industry. I was lucky enough just a couple of weeks ago to get up and, and introduce myself in person during the offsite retreat and meet everybody and the, the great culture that is SBCE. I'm super excited now to introduce myself to you, um, the board, and continue to interact with you for a long time now. Thank you. Welcome in your new role. Thanks, Owen. Our third introduction is Ethan Wolf, who is a summer intern from us, for us, and he is studying at Cornell right now. Ethan, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Girish. Um, I am the Power Resources team's new sustainability intern this summer, and I'll be working on a project to design a system incorporating carbon offsets, load shifting, and supply side tools to help make a 24 by 7 carbon neutral renewables portfolio more feasible for SVCE. Um, as you mentioned, I'm an incoming sophomore at Cornell studying sustainability and environmental economics. And my professional background includes a couple of marketing internships at uh, Uprise, which is a personal fintech startup based in San Francisco, and Greentown Los Altos, which is a local sustainability nonprofit, which some of you on the board may have heard of. Um, interestingly enough, I actually first heard about SVCE from my mentors at Greentown two years ago, and ever since then I've been highly interested in an internship. Um, however, as a junior in high school, um, I wasn't quite ready for a full-fledged clean energy internship. Um, but after getting some firsthand sustainable business experience as a consultant and now an incoming project manager at the Cornell Sustainability Consultants, uh, the stars aligned for me and I'm thrilled to finally have achieved my goal of being an intern at SVCE. Uh, in my free time, I'm an avid musician. Um, I play several instruments, including trombone, piano, guitar, and ukulele. And I'm also the principal trombonist for the Cornell Symphony Orchestra. And I also uh, enjoy weightlifting. I have several years experience with powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting. 
And it's really nice to meet everyone on the board, albeit virtually. And I'm really excited to uh, achieve what I can this summer with SVC and learn all that I can. So thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you and welcome, Ethan. And I think we have a musical group at SVCE. So don't be surprised you get called on, even virtually. <laughs> we'll, Sounds uh, awesome. Summer players, we'll see if we can do something this summer. Uh, I do have one, we have one more update. Uh, communications manager Pamela Leonard is going to talk to you about the 2022 Empower Silicon Valley competition. Great. Uh, good evening, directors. Um, I'm excited to share one of the videos of our winning scholarship competition. It's a short film comp competition with youth in the community. We do have a slide with some high-level stats. Um, we had um, incredible engagement this year. More than 40 students participated, either as individuals or in teams. And um, I want to give a shout out to Matt Lundy, who's actually currently attending his uh, COVID delayed graduation ceremony in Dublin from a master's in, I think, science communications or something cool like that. Um, so it's like 3 a.m. over there. But he did a wonderful job in leading outreach for uh, this uh, scholarship competition this year. And just want to call out and thank our board judges, so directors Abe Koga, Hilton Klein, and alternate director Wei. And um, with that, we'll um, share one of the videos and just want to call out the link to the web, uh, website, which has all of the winning videos in case anyone wants to go back and watch them later. So enjoy a little entertainment to kick off the evening. Good evening, Silicon Valley. I'm Charlotte. We begin tonight with a report on clean energy. Let's go to our first expert to learn what clean energy is. Hey folks, make sure to clean your electrical meter so you're receiving clean energy and saving the environment. Hmm, <laughs> I'm not sure that's quite right. Hold on. Breaking news. I'm being told that we have just been contacted by robots from the future. That's right, the future. Let's go to one of them now. Hello, can you see me? We need your help. We calculated that your time period can have the greatest impact on the future of the planet. If your Silicon Valley viewers make the right clean energy choices, irreversible global warming can be averted. Wow, this is amazing. We were just about to explain to our viewers what clean energy is. Clean energy means energy that is gathered from renewable, natural sources. The most common renewable energies are solar, wind, hydroelectric, and geothermal. Solar energy or energy from the sun can be collected with solar panels or used directly to heat water and air. Solar energy is beneficial because the amount of sunlight is practically infinite. Wind energy is produced by wind turbines or windmills mainly on wind farms. Hydroelectric energy is usually generated from dams. Geothermal energy is energy from heat trapped beneath the Earth's crust as a result of the Earth's formation billions of years ago. Geothermal power plants can use this heat to produce electricity. Unfortunately, as you can see behind me, the future where I am is not so great because not enough was done to adopt clean energy. Greenhouse gases from bad energy sources trap heat, causing climate change which led to extreme weather, wildfires, droughts, and food supply disruptions. Also, Organisms like you have a hard time breathing the polluted air and are being displaced by rising sea levels. So we are contacting you to encourage you to do more to switch from bad energy sources like oil, natural gas, and coal, to clean energy sources. Oh no! What can our viewers in Silicon Valley do to start using more clean energy? I can help with that. For electricity generation, there are several ways you can support clean energy. First, you can contact your local power company to join your local community choice aggregation, also known as a CCA, a program that offers green electricity at a reduced rate. If your city does not have such a program, encourage your city council to join one. In addition, 
you may be able to generate clean energy directly by adding solar panels to the building where you live or work. If that is not an option for you, you can volunteer with organizations like SunWork to help add solar panels to buildings in your community. When I think of dirty energy, I think of cars. What should we be doing about our transportation? Great question, Charlotte. About 45% of greenhouse gases are emitted from transportation. Some ways to switch to clean energy through transportation are driving or riding in electric vehicles. For short distances, your viewers can ride bikes, scooters, or skateboards. They can also walk instead of using gasoline-powered vehicles. Thanks. Is there anything we can change at home to better the environment? Well, Charlotte, about 24% of greenhouse gases are emitted from residential, commercial, and industrial heat. These can be reduced by switching to electric appliances that use clean electricity. 1. Installing an electric stove instead of using a gas stove. 2. Using an electric heat pump instead of a gas furnace. 3. Moving to a heat pump water heater from a gas water heater. 4. Using an electric fireplace instead of wood-burning fireplaces. Thank you all for listening. For the sake of this planet, I hope this educates you on and inspires you to switch to clean energy. Alright, that's it for now, folks. Thanks, robots, for this amazing experience and for educating us. Hope you come back soon and show us a better future after we make some improvements. Thank you, uh, board, for viewing that. And thank you, board members who served as judges. Uh, I'll just uh, reference that part of the CEO report in the packet, we have several presentations that have has useful information, including the summer readiness presentation and the clean power update and also our decarb grid innovation program and all our uh, community and customer outreach. Uh, please do review that at your leisure, and we'll be happy to answer questions outside of the meeting to you on those reports. Chair Gibbons, this, th that's the end of my report. Thank you, um, and again, thank you to all the people that um, worked so uh, successfully with the students on those um, videos and programs. They were phenomenal, and, and they are on our webpage, and I think you can uh, look at many of them and um, share with them in your constituencies and with friends. They are just spectacular. Well, very, very well done and great scholarships uh, awarded uh, to the uh, winners. Thank you. Item number three, amendment to the board delegate authority, delegated authority to participate in the PG&E voluntary allocation market offer, the VAMO to allow for the resale of excess allocation to one or more other CCAs. This is an action item. And the staff uh, presentation will be Charles Grinstead, Senior Manager of Power Resources. Charles. Thank you, Chair Gibbons. Uh, slide. All right, so uh, yes, uh, as Chair Gibbons mentioned, we're looking to amend our delegated authority to allow for resales to one or uh, more uh, CCAs. So just as a reminder, the voluntary allocation market offer is a mechanism which allows uh, renewable energy credits from the PG&E portfolio to transfer to migrated customers such as CCAs like the SVCE. And so on May 11, 2022, the SVCE board unanimously, unanimously approved delegating authority to Grish to participate in VAMO for up to SBC's full allocation, representing about 25% of SBC's annual retail sales. Uh, since the board meeting, uh, the CPUC and PG&E have extended the allocation, the allocate, the election deadline to July 9, 2022, uh, to allow participants more time to participate and uh, incorporate VAMO allocations in their RPS plans. They deemed this to be a, an important factor in developing the RPS plan. Um, and uh, they also issued a classification on PCC zeros. And so PC zeros are grandfathered RECs. These are contracts that have been executed prior to 2009. And so because we are a migrated customer, PC zeros should retain that classification and we should be allowed to count uh, unlimited amount of PC zeros in our portfolio. And so uh, since that 
uh, board meeting, we've also received some interest from third parties in purchasing a portion of our VAMO share. Uh, other CCAs have reached out who are you know, maybe experiencing similar issues regarding uh, contract start dates on their resources. And so uh, this is a viable product in securing long-term recs. And so we are requesting the ability to transact excess shares of our VAMO such that the transactions mirror the product mix and term of the underlying VAMO contract. And since uh, we'll, and, and so we'll only engage in pricing structures tied to the market price benchmark, and we must have an executed third party contract prior to accepting additional share of the VAMO beyond SVC's internal needs. And this would protect us against uh, a counterparty that may um, uh, you know, look for a shorter term, we would want to mirror the contract of the underlying resources so that we're not taking on excess recs over time. Uh, next slide, please. And so our recommendation is to amend the previous authorization uh, for SBC's chief executive officer uh, to participate in the pg e voluntary allocation uh, for SBC's portion of the low rata share and execute any necessary agreements, including the voluntary allocation confirmation under pg e and SBC's master agreement, uh, and then resale quantities not necessary to meet SBC's internal needs. Uh, and then, so Garish will only exercise the delegated authority should he deem it necessary to meet long-term procurement directives or for any resales of the allocation. And of course, we'll always report back to the board in a timely fashion. And that is the last slide and just have to open it up to discussion. Thank you, Charles. Uh, as you know, we had a, a good discussion um, <clears throat> about the VAMO uh, program at our last meeting, and this is an opportunity to uh, expand the effectiveness of that program amongst other CCAs. And does the board have any questions of staff? I see no questions here in the chamber. Are there any questions from the board online? I see no hands raised. With that, we will go to the public. Are there any comments from the public on this item? I see no hands raised uh, for the public online or in the chamber. We will return it to a discussion uh, from the board and or a motion. I see no discussion. Is anyone wishing to make a motion? Make the motion to approve, um, Abhi Koga. Thank you. We have a motion by Director Abhi Koga. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. We have a second by Director Lee. May we have a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Chair. Chair Gibbons? Aye. Vice Chair Tyson? Yes. Willie? Aye. Flieger? Yes. Klein? Yes. Hilton? Aye. Rennie? Aye. Thank you. Chua? Aye. Ilahi? Aye. Martinez Beltran? Yes. Abe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you all for that, and uh, thank you, Charles, for that presentation. We will now move on to item number four, which is authorize the chief executive officer to execute necessary agreements with California Community Power and participating community choice aggregators for the renewable resources from the Ormont Nevada Inc. and the Open Mountain Energy LLC. This is an, also an action item by the board. And um, Monica Padilla will be uh, our CE COO and Director of Power Resources will make a presentation. Monica. Good evening, directors. Good evening, Chair Gibbons. So tonight I come to you with the request to approve a second set of contracts through CC Power for, to meet our midterm reliability procurement order. So these contracts um, are both for geothermal, excuse me, and I will go through the slides pretty quick. So just a reminder, in June, the CPUC adopted a, a proposed decision requiring that all, excuse me. I think it was our dinner lemonade. <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me. So requiring that all load serving entities essentially 
um, procure resources to meet deficiencies that it sees happening in the future with the ability to meet power supply needs. So the, the deficient, the, the procurement order is called the midterm reliability procurement order. And for the most part, it's generic resources that we have to purchase. But they do have carve outs in the latter years that include long duration storage and firm clean resources. So a few months ago, we brought to the board approval for the, um, excuse me, the long duration storage resources. And tonight we bring to you approval of the firm clean resources. So we've issued two um, RFOs, a request for offers, to meet these requirements. The first one was an RFO that was issued on behalf of CC Power to meet, again, the long duration storage purchase uh, order. The second RFO was the one that was done through CC Power again to meet that third requirement, which we again we call Firm Clean Resources. So that RFO was issued back in October of 2021 through CC Power. San Jose Clean Energy administered the RFO, and Sonoma Clean Energy and a bunch of CCAs got together to do essentially the administration and the evaluation of, of that RFO. The proposals were due in December. We essentially received six um, basic offers from different bidders for 16 different projects. While firm clean resources could be met by uh, not just geothermal, they could also be met by biomass type resources. Uh, all of the proposals that we received were for geothermal. Uh, the projects for the most part are located in Nevada. There were a couple of projects located in California, including one in what we call the California Independent System Operating uh, Balancing Authority. But for the most part, most of the projects were located outside of the Cal ISO. The, um, the RFO or the, the way that CC Power works is that you have to put in place what's called a project oversight committee. And the project oversight committee is made up of staff from each of the different CCAs that are participating in the RFP. Uh, for SVCE, that was me. And so that project oversight committee is responsible for the evaluation and the ultimate recommendation of shortlisting projects to the general manager of CC Power. So through that process, the Project Oversight Committee essentially recommended two different projects. The first one being, again, the ORMAT Nevada uh, geothermal portfolio of contracts. And then the second one being from Open Mountain Energy, um, a geothermal project called Fish Lake Geothermal. Additionally, in form of background, on May 31st, 2022, as required by CC Power, uh, the, the board did three things. First, it waived a resolution that provided for a 60-day notice. This is part of the JPA of CC Power. But because we had to move these contracts quickly, the board actually waived that, uh, that 60-day notice. It also, through resolutions, uh, approved uh, CC Power's authority to enter into those two contracts for geothermal. And uh, for the record, uh, our CEO, Garish Balachandran, serves on the CC Power Board of Directors, so that was um, his decision on behalf of FC FCE. So uh, these are the, essentially the projects that we expect to go both uh, for Open Mountain Energy and for, and for the ORMAT resources. Again, they're all located in Nevada. And so because they're located in Nevada, there's a little bit of a risk that these projects may not count towards our uh, midterm reliability obligations unless we're able to acquire what's called import capability. And so we're all in the process, all the CCAs that are participating and the developers in themselves are in the process of figuring out how to get those import allocation rights so that these contracts can count towards the MTR requirements and can also count towards our resource adequacy needs. So to talk a little bit about the first uh, project that we're seeking approval on tonight, this is the ORMAP portfolio of geothermal projects. Um, as you, some of you may know, we have a power purchase agreement in place already with ORMAT for a project called Casa Diablo. That project is actually coming online any minute, um, maybe in the next couple of weeks. Excited about that. So this is a very similar uh, technology that will be used in the portfolio of resources. It's binary geothermal. It's all new geothermal, so that's required in the midterm reliability procurement order uh, that anything that we procure has to be incremental that is just not already built. Uh, the project uh, portfolio will have a minimum capacity requirement of 64 megawatts and can go up to 125 megawatts. 
The product that's being offered is, includes energy, PCC1 RPS resources, and full capacity rights for resource adequacy. Uh, the expected COD for these resources varies. Projects will be elected into the portfolio as early as 2024, and uh, the project is offered to the CC Power participants at a fixed price in the form of a dollar per megawatt hours, and it's for a term of 20 years. Uh, just to quickly go over how that portfolio approach will work, um, ORMAT will bring to SVCE and to the participants in CC Power, um, as they develop these projects, they'll come to us and say, okay, we have this project, we've done the development, of, we've done the exploration of it, it's ready to be added to the portfolio. And then each of the participating members will decide whether or not they wanna add that facility to the portfolio. And so the reason that we would maybe reject a resource to, or a facility to the portfolio is because we were not able to get the import capability and therefore it doesn't count towards our obligations or it doesn't meet resource adequacy requirements or we determine that the volume is not needed. And so that could happen if say we, one of the participants in this uh, joint venture or joint procurement drops out or say somebody finds another geothermal resource that they um, that meets their need for some, uh, that they didn't think they had before. Um, if the facility is rejected, then uh, ORMAT has the ability to reduce the minimum 65 mega megawatt requirement amount. Open Mountain Energy Fish, Fish Lake project is a bit simpler. It's one project, 13 uh, megawatts, SBC shared being about 1.82 megawatts. Um, it also is uh, incremental, meaning it's new capacity, as is required. It also will provide energy, RPS, PCC1 resources, and full capacity rights. It's located in Esmeralda County, Nevada. Um, we believe the COD would also be mid-2024. It's offered at a fixed price with no escalation in the form of dollar per megawatt hours, and it too is a 20-year project. So uh, participating in this joint procurement effort are Clean Power SF, Peninsula Clean Energy, San Jose Clean Energy, Silicon Valley, obviously Central Coast Community Energy, Redwood Coast Energy Authority, Son Sonoma Clean Power, and Valley Clean Energy. SBCE share of the ORMAT uh, portfolio of resources would be 13.4%. Its entitlement share in terms of megawatts, assuming 125 megawatts are added to the portfolio, is 16.75 megawatts. Uh, for the OHM project, or the Fish Lake Geothermal, our share would be 14% of the, the full joint procurement, uh, equating to 1.82 megawatts for a total of 18.57 megawatts. So if the ORMAP um, portfolio of resources results in the 125 megawatt max capacity that we're seeking collectively, then all of the participants in this joint procurement effort will have met their MTR requirements, including SVCE. So that is um, something that we're uh, pretty confident, provided we can get the import capacity, that um, we will all be able to meet this requirement. For SVCE, um, we'll actually be slightly surplus the requirement, and that is because uh, the contract that I mentioned before that's going to come online in the next couple of weeks with ORMAT, the Casa Diablo, uh, we were allowed to count that capacity towards our midterm reliability procurement. And so um, we're excited about that because the project, um, again, is going to add valuable baseload resource to the grid. So in addition to meeting our midterm reliability requirements, um, the, the two geothermal contracts have the uh, benefit of adding uh, PCC1 resources to our portfolio, and because they're long-term, that is greater than 10 years, they will also help us meet our, our SB350 requirements. And so it's been a while since I've shared this table with you, but if you recall, um, all of the load-serving entities under California, um, serving in California have an RPS requirement, and those requirements can be, uh, are reflected in different compliance periods with compliance period four, the first compliance period in this, in this table, being 2021 through 2024. So that, for that period, we have an RPS of 40%. Of that, 65% have to be in the form of long-term contracts, 
um, amounting to a 26% RPS for, uh, in long-term contracts for compliance period four. With the contracts that we've executed to date, we're at 37.6%, so uh, uh, significantly above what the minimum requirement is. Of course, all of our resources um, are in different stages of, of development, so there are risks associated with those resources, and for that reason, we've also over-procured. Now, these two geothermal contracts uh, are small, and since they come online in the latter part of 2024, the compliance period four, they won't contribute more, very much uh, energy towards that compliance period, but they do contribute them in the outer compliance periods. So you can see how that how they impact our um, our compliance requirements. The contract structure is very similar to what we use for long duration storage. Uh, CC Power will be the off taker. That is, they will sign the PPA or the power purchase agreement with the different developers and the developers will acquire what's called the Buyer's Liability Pass-Through Agreement, or a BLIPTA. That BLIPTA guarantees performance by each participating member. And so it, is, in a sense, protects CC power, and it protects ourselves from each other, that my liability is, or SVCE's liability is only SVCE's liability. Uh, the contract in your packet is provided in substantive form. Again, CC power approved this contract, these two contracts last week, and then executed the contracts um, with the developer. The two contracts have a condition precedent in them that if the participating members don't get their board approvals or governing approvals within 120 days, the contracts terminate automatically. And so that is why we have to get approval as, as quickly as possible. Uh, both contracts meet CC Power's um, directives towards labor, environment, and enviro environmental justice preferences. Uh, including for workforce and acquiring the necessary permits for environmental and then attesting to not using forced labor um, and, and including uh, benefits to the local community. The other part of the contract structure involves what's called the project participation share agreement. This is an agreement between CC Power and the participating members. It basically establishes our obligations and benefits under the CC Power Developer PPA. Um, it in also includes a step up provision. And the step up provision is necessary so that if one of us, for whatever reason, defaults on the contract, that the other members will pick up our share that we abandon. Um, but this step up provision is capped to 125% of the original entitlement share of each participating members. And that's necessary so that we don't have, uh, so that we ourselves limit our risk. Um, if it goes beyond 125%, then the developer is left carrying that excess capacity and has to remarket it. Um, in terms of governing structure, uh, very similar to long duration storage, each particip participating member, including SBCE, will get a vote on matters pertaining to these two contracts. Uh, Non-participating members that are part of CC Power will have to abstain, and then this Contract structure also uh, creates this project oversight committee, which will be used to make a lot of the operational and contract management decisions. So um, in addition to providing uh, midterm reliability procurement uh, compliance requirements, as I mentioned, it provides RPS, PCC1, including contributions to SB350. Uh, the two contracts have the benefit of reducing SVC's portfolio risk. These are base load resources, so they deliver a consistent amount of energy uh, almost on a 24 by seven basis, um, providing for grid reliability, uh, limited ancillary services, uh, resource adequacy. Uh, of course, they reduce greenhouse gas emissions because they're clean resources, and they move us closer to achieving a 24 by seven carbon-free goal. Oops. This is just a schematic of the approval process. Uh, again, this was a huge effort on behalf of the CCAs that participated, uh, being led by San Jose Clean Energy and Sonoma Clean Power. Uh, it's, it takes a, it's, it's amazing how uh, much work goes into this, and, and we got this done pretty quickly. So tonight's request for the board is to delegate authority to the CEO to execute the necessary project participation share agreements and the buyer's liability pass-through agreements with California Community Power and participating members for the two new geothermal projects. 
Uh, the description of the projects are here. Included um, would be a not to exceed amount for the ORMAT project of 256 million over the life of the project, and for the Open Mountain Energy contract, uh, 30 million over the life of the project. That's the end of my presentation. That's sufficient. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I go really fast, I get a little nervous, and I'm a fast talker. So. <laughs> would you would you leave that last slide up? That would be helpful for everyone. No, you were excellent. Thank you for pulling together um, material that we understand from previous discussions and uh, providing the summary here. This is a project that um, is directly related to um, a new carve out required by the CPUC, right? Exactly. Right. So. Um, thank you for that presentation. Do we have any questions from the board? I see one hand raised and from Director Alahi. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the presentation. I know it's very complicated. You've got a lot of different agencies. I, I just wanted a clarification. Uh, we have under this agreement the right to purchase a certain amount of uh, energy. Uh, I'm trying to figure out if we decide not to purchase any, are we liable for that amount? Because I know some of it gets shared by other people, or are we? Or can we just walk away if we decide not to purchase any for whatever reason? No, we have an obligation to take our entitlement share of the energy that's produced from both projects. So it's not an option or a choice. Once we sign the contracts, we are committing to take that energy. The only way we can get out of the contract is, is for some reason we default, and that's usually um, because we go into bankruptcy or something else. But no, these are, these are firm commitments on our part. Every participant is, uh, is committing to that, but if one participant can't take their energy, then the other participants can pick up that load? Yes, if there's a participant that defaults for whatever reason, then a step up provision kicks in. And so we all, if say there's 10 megawatts that becomes uh, available, then we all have to take our pro rata share of that 10 megawatts, but no more than 125% of our original entitlement share. And are we required to do that, or that's our choice? No, that's a requirement. Okay. Thank you up for that. To, up to 125% of our entitlement share. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. I, uh, yes, please. Thank uh, you. Director uh, Flygor. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Monica, for that presentation and all the work you did in pulling this together in such a short time. Um, Director Allah, he actually asked um, one of my questions because I wanted to better understand that step-up provision. Um, so if a participating CCA were to default, we each, the continuing participating CCAs would have to take a portion of the share up to 125%. But what exactly would the defaulting CCA be responsible for? Oh, good question. There's, if they terminate, if they leave, they have a termination payment that they would have good. to make the rest of us whole. Good, okay. Yeah. So they don't just get off scot-free. No. <laughs> Great. And then how do we demonstrate import capability or capacity? Because that sounds like a key component of all of this. Oh gosh, I was hoping nobody would ask me that question. <laughs> uh, if Charles is on the line, he might be able to help me here. But so. Well, and, and, and uh, what I, I'm really trying to get to is, is it doable? Is, yes, it, is yes. it something we'll be able to do? Is there a concern there? Uh, yes and no. Okay. So for uh, part of the reason that mm -hmm. we were um, somewhat under the gun to get these contracts done quickly, especially the ORMAT contract, is because the California Independent System Operator has opened up a new process called MIC expansion. So that's Maximum Import Capability Expansion. And that allows you to actually um, ask for multiple years of import capacity rights, but you have to have a power purchase agreement to get those. And so the collective, only the load, only us CCAs can ask for those import rights. The developer can't ask for them. But the developer, if it has a PPA with load, can go to the ISO and ask for them. So we applied for those on June 1st. We're, we won't know for a while whether we got them or not. The second opportunity we have is through an annual process where we get allocated import allocation rights. And those are rights that we, we get a share of PG&E's original import rights because we took a portion of mm -hmm. their load. And so every year we will nominate for the locations that we need them at. So if it's, I don't know what the terms are, but there's things like Mona and Gonder and all these different locations, we will ask for import al allocation rights there, and then hopefully we'll get awarded. 
if we're not awarded the import allocation rights, then uh, under the ORMAT structure, we can reject the contracts in the beginning. If we don't get the multi-year, then we could be stuck with a year where we don't have import allocation mm -hmm. rights. Um, for Open Mountain, we, since it's such a small contract, and we're pretty confident, high degree of confidence that we can get the import allocation rights because of where it's located. Uh, if for whatever reason we don't get the rights, then we still have to take the contract and we don't have a resource adequacy contract, but we have an RPS contract in that case. Got it. <laughs> wow. Okay. I hope I so did it's it a justice, process, Charles. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you don't sound concerned, so that's good, and there are different options. Um, and just to confirm, so all participating CCAs have to approve this agreement. Yes. Otherwise, it fails. It goes away. There's no agreement. Well, Let's say one participating CCA board right. does not approve the agreement. What happens? So... I'm going to have to maybe punt on this one, but on the ORMAT contract, the way I understand it is that we, we don't have, I may have misspoken earlier, we don't have that same 120 day requirement necessarily that it terminates. What would happen is that instead of taking 125 megawatts, say we decided to, to drop off and we were 16 megawatts, then the max capacity would drop by that 16 mm. megawatts. Um, with the open mountain, um, I think, think that one of us, anybody, if it's, you know, say one megawatt becomes free because a small CCA doesn't get approval, then we would have the ability to ask to take that megawatt, some of the other participating members, before it would terminate. So I shouldn't have said it automatically terminates. We have the ability to, for the rest of us to pick it up. Great. Thank you. And I, and I get nervous now when I see long-term contracts with so much uncertainty. Um, but thank you. It's again. the nature of the business. It is. It is. Yeah. And and you know yeah. there's just so much uncertainty right now in the market. But thanks, Monica. Yes. And I also think it helps um, when um, staff is prepared to answer the questions that they ha you have looked at these issues and there are processes in place to address them. Yeah. So I thank you for that as well. And um, yes, to, um, Director Willie. Yeah. Thank you for a wonderful <coughs> and very detailed presentation. I think the answer to my question is going to be, yeah, absolutely, but I think it's good to ask anyway. The question being, if our contractual amount is $256 million, <laughs> are we really confident that uh, ORMAT has the backing, has the wherewithal? I mean, if our portion is 16% of the total, that adds up to a $1.6 billion project, and wow. And so, so yeah. what, kind of, what kind of scrutiny are we even able to do to, to convince ourselves that they are, you know, they're not going to get the $256 million no, from no, us, no, no, no. but ultimately they would but they've got to have one heck of a big uh, support behind them to make this happen. And so what kind of checks and balances can we Yeah, that's a really good do? question. <laughs> now you made me nervous. <laughs> so uh, ORMAT is one of the, the leading developers of geothermal in California and Nevada, first of all. And so these contracts are all pay as you go, right? We don't pay for anything that doesn't get delivered. And all the, con the our contracts also have performance guarantees in them as well. So that if the developer doesn't perform, first there's development securities. So if the projects don't get developed, then there's deposits that get refunded to, or get, get paid to the, the participants. But then after the project becomes COD or becomes online, then there's performance deposits that guarantee the performance of the contracts. And so uh, yes, 20 years is a long time and a lot of things can happen. A lot of things do happen, and a lot of times things change ownership, or things, and those, that's just the nature of the business. And so whoever is here when these projects are online and delivering will have to monitor them very carefully to make sure they're performing. Anytime they don't perform, and there's all kinds of provisions in the contract that they have to produce a guaranteed amount of energy over a certain period of time, they have to provide capacity, all this stuff. As soon as that doesn't happen, then there's mechanisms in the contract 
that allow us to terminate, that allow the, the buyers to terminate. So, <clears throat> um, if I kind of go back to, you know, just trying to determine the, the wherewithal of the company, yeah, pay as you go, great, so we're not clearly on the hook, but the fact that we really are contractually uh, extending ourselves to the tune, you know, of 256 million that we could put in some other uh, uh, contract. So convincing ourselves that ORMAT really does have the wherewithal to do this as opposed to, well, it's a great idea, but we're not really convinced that, or we haven't been, they haven't showed us that they, they truly have the wherewithal to make their own huge financial commitments to dig down as deep as they have to go and set this geothermal plant up and running. Mm -hmm. But yet we would still, I would tend to think we're not able to shift that if we thought that later on, gee whiz, maybe they're not moving as fast as they, they uh, should have been or something, and we say, well, we'd like to go put that 256 million in a more sure project. And so I'm just kind of yeah, saying, so being con fully convinced that, right. that they really are uh, up to this big task. Right. So. so again, we have a procurement order and that procurement order requires that we get these new resources contracted for and online no later than 2026, so June of 2026. Because these projects take years to develop, as we all know, we have to sign a contract now or within the next few months. And the, the this procurement order that the CPUC put out there in June 2021 has created pretty much a buying frenzy, right? And so this has become a very much a seller's market. We did our best job as a group of CCAs to put together what we thought a very uh, good request for proposals or request for offers, and we got very limited participation in that RFO. And at the same time, we know that the IOUs are also out there buying these resources because they too are mandated to buy these resources. In my opinion, we did the best job with what was available to us. We picked the best projects that we could pick, um, and that included looking at the economics, looking at the developer themselves and their, uh, their, their uh, experience in, this, in developing these projects in California and in the Cal ISO. And um, at the end of the day, we had to pick the capacity to meet our compliance order. This is not a discretionary purchase on our behalf. If, if I may, I actually think your question is a little bit different. Okay. I mean, uh, we have in these contracts um, investigated the um, financial stability of the company, right? We go through that full... Um, yes, we evaluate, we, we assess the developers that submit offers into our proposals as part of our evaluation process. Su such as a, a bond rating or, or corporate rating, whatever the phrasing is, we evaluate right. each company for their stability in the financial. Uh, and then in each contract, there are agreements for if this doesn't happen we get money uh, kind of thing there's guarantees financial guarantees on both performance sides. guarantees performance yes guarantees okay so that's great thank you i was going to ask that same question slightly different but you you, you got to the end and the uh, essence of it so thank you yeah, i didn't mean i, I thought you. that's where you were going i just wanted to make sure we got there thank you sorry uh, okay, so is there any other question from the members of the board here in chambers? Seeing none, other, uh, and yes, and I also have Director Alahi's hand raised. If there's anyone else wishing to speak before we go to the public, any questions? Director Alahi. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, it is difficult, obviously, you're trying to predict over the next 10 years or 20 years what's going on, and you've done due diligence, and I don't know if that information about the particular about ORMET or open mounted energy is provided in the packet or something, so we can also look at it and say, okay, these these guys are probably not going to go away. But there's a flip side to it. It seems like it's not the people who are developing that are having problems. It's like the market goes up and they can now sell the energy at a much higher price and they want to back out of it. And uh, we maybe come up with excuses of one sort or the other, saying that that allows them to get out of the contract. Uh, 
and so, so how do you cover for that? And what kind of uh, language is in the contract to make sure that if they try to get out, it's uh, you know the performance bond or whatever the bonds are. Uh, how, how tight has that been now? Uh, put into the contracts because you got both. They, they, they either go bankrupt and get out, or they just say, "Well, the market is really high now, so pay me twice as much." And uh, puts 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 in a no win puts us in a no win position at that point. Yeah, both contracts have uh, termination provisions in them that are very limited on how and when and who can terminate before commercial operation of these contracts. Um, if the projects can't get built for whatever reason, they don't get the permits, um, something else happens at the location, at the site, then there are, are, there's ability to terminate under those circumstances. But short of that, the sellers don't have the right to terminate these contracts for any reason. Yeah, I, I understand that. I guess that's what hopefully the council and everybody has looked at. Thank you. And just one other thing to note, so, you know, these are 20-year contracts for sure. These are big projects, lots of infrastructure involved in these projects. Um, ORMAT could develop these projects and go away in five, ten years, whatever, but the projects are still there. And so we have rights to the project. So if they assign it or sell it to somebody else, we still get the output from the, that project. Understood. Thank you, and I see a hand raised by Director Martinez Beltran. I may ask you to go to this one. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Monica. Hi. I just want to ask, <laughs> great job on this. I'm just trying to understand if, if we were not to be able to get the import um, approval. I know that this is a small percentage of our retail sales. Will we, would we need this to for our own energy resources? I mean, would we need to then shop and find something else? Uh, yeah, if, again, for, for the Open Mountain Energy one, if we're not able to get the import allocation rights, then it becomes an RPS resource only. And we won't use it for, we can't use it for midterm reliability procurement, and we cannot use it for resource adequacy. Um, with the ORMAT geothermal, if we can't get the import allocation rights um, or the, the multiple year import capability, um, then the pro we would most likely reject the facilities and until we get to the minimum quantity. And then we would have an RPS resource. Um, realistically, if we find ourselves in that position that none of us CCAs can get the import capability, then we have a much bigger problem at the state of California. And we would have discussions with the California Public Utility Commission and the California Independent System Operator that, look, you've made this procurement order that cannot be filled in the state of California because there's just not enough new geothermal capacity that can be built in the Cal ISO. The only other geothermal that you can really build in California is, is located down in the Imperial Irrigation District. And that, too, is outside of the California Independent System Operator. So you also need import rights in order to make that count for reliability. So if we can't, if none of us, between the eight of us can't get the rights, then we have a much bigger problem in meeting this procurement order for geothermal. And we would go to the CPUC and we would tell them that. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, uh, appreciate those questions. And with that, we will move to um, public comment. Is there anyone in the public wishing to speak? Uh, we look at the audience here in the chambers. There are no hands raised. Do we have any hands raised online? No chair, no hands. Thank you. With that, we will uh, bring the discussion back to counts, uh, back to the board, and ask uh, for discussion and or motion. Yes, Director Willie. Yeah, I, I actually uh, came up with one more uh, question, and. And I probably could have asked it in one of our many previous meetings. So I, I think you said that uh, this contract will be paying a dollar per megawatt hour, and it's a 20 year. How do they settle on a price, or does it have incremental increases over the 20 years? Yeah, so I did not disclose the price of, of oh. either of the PPAs. We do not disclose that in public. 
um, but they are offered to us at a fixed price. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, the price is determined based on the cost to produce that energy, so to extract the geothermal, produce it, maintenance, barrel O&M. But I'm assuming that given the market conditions and the procurement order that exists and our own experience in contracting for these resources not too long ago, that there's a bit of market pricing that's going on based on what the developers think these things are worth in the market right now given the procurement order. So <clears throat> 10 years out. There's, there's no escalator on the contracts. It's a fixed yeah. flat price. Yeah. Wow, that's great. I mean, I think that's great for us. You know, so thank you. You're welcome. Any other no, and Chair, I'm ready to make a motion. I believe that's appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's appropriate. Um, thank you, Chair. And Clark, do you want us to make two separate motions for each agreement or as written in the agenda? Uh, as written would be fine. Okay, thank you. So I move that we authorize the Chief Executive Officer to execute necessary agreements with California Community Power on participating community choice aggregators for renewable resources from Ormat Nevada Inc. and Open Mountain Energy LLC. And great job again, Monica, great presentation. Thank you. A second, Chua. So we have a motion by Director Flygor, seconded by D Director Chua, thank you. May we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, thank you. Chair Gibbons? Aye. Vice Chair Tyson? Yes. Director Willie? Yes. Flieger? Yes. Klein? Yes. Hilton? Aye. Rennie? Aye. Thank you. Chua? Aye. Elahi? Aye. Martinez Botron? Aye. Abe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you, that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, all right, and we will now move to item number five. This is the Silicon Valley Strategic Plan FY23 update. It is a discussion, and uh, the CEO, Balachandran, will be pr making this presentation. Thank you, Chair Gibbons, members of the board try to keep this going, so since Chair Gibbon said you'll get a break at 8.30. Um, so we've got the slides up. So every year we undertake a strategic plan, and this year is no different. Uh, here's an overview of the timeline, and the strategic plan actually has a variety of different outcomes we look for. One is the conversation we have with you as the board on what's coming up, what, how you want to direct us in terms of priorities. You also set my goals. You also decide what goes into the budget. And I decide what, how to implement these goals through the work plan that we develop for the entire team. We want to do all these in parallel so that they're all synced up. So here's a timeline that we have. We've presented the strategic plan uh, to the uh, executive committee. And this timeline, these arrows tell you these different layers that I've talked to you about. Go to the next slide. This is a schematic of what we have in our strategic work plan. On the left-hand side is the actual strategic plan, which is on our website that we publish. It's like a 15-page document. It has a mission. It has 21 goals, and it has 75 measures. That's what we use on an almost monthly basis to track the work that we are doing. Now, of course, things change during the year, and then we adapt to that. The point I want to make with this schematic is sharing all those measures and all the specifics of the goals with you, it's not a productive use of your time and our time. 
So as we go through this process, we try and kind of get it up to a higher level of let's shine a spotlight on some incremental areas that we want to focus on. So if you go to the next slide, again, just a schematic of the kind of detail we have in the actual work plan that we'll be bringing to you only in October. But today we're going to talk about high level stuff. So if we can go to the next slide. We started with a day all of us spent at Hakoni Gardens on April 29th. And prior to the meeting, we had some preparatory materials. And we kind of themed the day as the past five years, because it was right around our five year anniversary. And what do we think is coming up in the next five years? We had a lot of exercises in that day within each department. So for example, Amrit is talking to his department saying, okay, given the mission that we have, what can finance and admin do? Then we had exercises between departments about interdependencies between them and we cycled through. Lots of flip charts, lots of note taking. We took that all back and a smaller team put together in the next week, we put together all these notes, synthesized it, and about 17 of us, so all the managers, supervisors, and directors got together in another all day retreat, which was virtual, and we synthesized this further. One of the things we asked each department to do and each director to do was, what's that next five years kind of going to look like is the things that we should be focusing on that we are not focusing on right now in order to meet our mission. Then we got all the directors to take a look at this. They said, if you were making this presentation to the board, how would you prioritize so that we could get each one of us have a different viewpoint, right? Because each director has their department that they're managing, but they're also connected to a greater whole. So each of these exercises were valuable in their own way. And if you can go to the next, stepping to the highest level, we have a mission and our measure, which has been the same for several years. In Talking to staff, my own opinion, talking to the executive committee, uh, we don't think we need to change this. This is aspirational enough uh, to keep it as is for the current year. Next slide. In terms of our future five goals, these were the 12 that we just wanted to highlight. Remember that we still have many goals that you have already approved in past years that are in flight. So those are things that we're gonna to continue to do. I'm gonna ask Andrea to move to a slide in the appendix so that we can talk about what, you had, what we had all decided your priorities or focus areas from last year. So I'll just talk about that so we can have context. Okay, it's actually, Andrew, can you go up one slide from here? Yeah. So these were the six strategic focus areas that you decided last year. Additional staffing, operations mode, which was there are PPAs coming online. So the slide that we're going to go to next, which is, Andrew, we can, I'll show you a little more detail and talk to it as to what we've accomplished. We can go to the next slide. So additional staffing, we reached the lowest level of our staffing last August when we went down to 22 employees. Uh, over this last year, we have lost about six employees and we've added about 14. Today we are 32 employees with a budget at 39. I expect to propose more employees in the coming year and staffing 
and culture is going to still remain, in my opinion, the highest priority for us. Operations mode with PPAs coming online. Several of you were with us when we went to the slate ribbon cutting. That was the first solar storage project that came online. There were months and months and months of preparation prior to that on how to integrate that with the KISO grid, getting our systems in place. Um, we have a few of our staff who were recently hired who took a lead role in this. We had folks like uh, Charles Grinstead, uh, Zach Liskey, and Monica Steam, uh, and other people at her team meeting every morning at 7.45 for months on end to get these operations in. So we did get that first PPA online, and some of you are there. The next one is procurement clean energy mix and integration, which is we continue to buy new clean resources like the resources that you just approved on the two geothermal projects in the previous item. So that has to do with mandated procurement. Financial stability and trade-offs. If you remember last year, with the PCIA going up, we actually drew our reserves down. We were in the red in order to keep our discount. So one of the things that we talked about is we need to move out of the red and get in the black and build up our reserves. We also talked about the power prepay, and that was an initiative that Amrit led. We did this in partnership with EBCE. It was a complex financial structuring uh, deal that is saving us close to $2 million a year right now. Energy risk management, we have Karthik Rajan, who is working in Monica's group. He's been promoted to a senior risk manager, and he is a shared resource between Umrit's group and Monica's group, but he is housed in the finance and administration side. Umrit has also been leading a multi-department effort called business process optimization, which gets into the next item, which is internal operations. So in, when we started, right, we started with simple spreadsheets, access databases, because we have a few deals. Now we have dozens and dozens and dozens of deals when you think about RA. I, I, I can't tell you how much we do. Charles is working a lot to make sure that we are compliant on our resource adequacy. All those things require enterprise systems. Amrit has a lot of experience in that, so business process optimization is a project that is now in flight. So for this coming year, I'm not going to highlight BPO because that's already a priority, it's budgeted, that's, already, that's going to be part of our plan. Cyber and physical risk is something that we continue to invest in. And that is something that we'll have to be cyber fit going forward, and we'll continue to invest in that. The last uh, goal was something that the board added kind of late in the year. If you remember, in August of last year, the IPCC's Code Red report came out. Subsequent to that, just as my goals were being set, uh, the board uh, basically directed this last goal. And what we've done on this is you've heard presentations from Justin Zagunas on the doubling down strategy. And what the board has approved is $17 million to be spent over and above the close to $15 million that's already in our budget. That is going, so you've already approved that in March of this year. Now we've got to develop the capability and the capacity to actually develop programs and implement them. So though you had each one of these as priorities, some of them will just become in flight. I'm not gonna highlight this anymore because that's just gonna be part of our work plan. 
So I wanted to provide you a little bit of detail, both to tell you the kind of work that we're doing, and also as we get back to the slide that we were at earlier in the presentation, it'll give you context for the kind of questions uh, I'm going to ask, uh, the question I have of you, which is you know, getting some further input. So if we can go to the next slide here. So of those 12 boxes, and it's not necessarily in uh, priority order, I put the numbers in there just so it's easy for you to point out a box. Uh, you can just refer to a box by the number. Everything in this slide is important, as is everything in our work plan that is important, right? Over here, I wanted to shine a spotlight on a few things because they are different than what we've talked about before. I want to connect two, five, and eight. When we talk about being the supplier of choice and working electrification into SVC's value proposition and 24 by seven clean energy, these are things we really haven't talked about too much at the board level. The five years that we have been a clean energy organization, we've basically been buying clean energy on an annual basis. That's how we do our accounting. The grid is moving to getting cleaned every hour. The PUC is moving there through the resource adequacy process, through the IRP process, that's where legislation, Senator Becker introduced legislation last year and this year on this concept. That's where we are headed. It will be expensive to get to 24 by seven, but that's the way we've got to go to clean up our grid. Number eight talks about our value proposition. We talk about our value proposition in terms of clean energy, but we want to talk about it more in terms of clean by hour and also electrification. The work that is being led by our programs group and our energy services group on reach codes, for example, is increasing electrification in the building stock, both new buildings and existing buildings. We want to talk about electrifying our transportation. So to raise that in our consciousness, so to speak, in our strategic plan, working electrification to SVC's value proposition is something else that we're looking at. Number three, box number three, is leveraging our balance sheet for structured financing. Last year, we had the prepay which is a structured financing product using our credit rating, et cetera, and through some complex financial um, uh, engineering, we are able to get $2 million worth of savings. What we were talking about here was, to the extent that we have a strong balance sheet, are there ways in which we can develop products and programs that will help on decarbonizing at scale? It could be tariff on-bill financing. It could be loan programs. This, it's a concept. We don't actually have any major specifics on this. But in talking about it, this is the whole point of the strategic plan. It's kind of like, what are the strengths we have? How, does it, how can we use the strengths we have to achieve our mission at a greater level? So this is, another kind of, this is a pretty major one. The activity of the next year may just be, we may spend money on some consultants to come in and work with us to come up with some ideas. So this may be a two to three year kind of initiative on number three. So uh, this is essentially what we talked about I'll just touch on some of the others, efficient and effective internal operations. We've got to continue to do that to remove friction from the system. Number six is as we get more of our resources into our portfolio, we've got to optimize them in the markets. 
Number seven, I've highlighted program policies. We talked about, we talk about our legislative and regulatory outreach. Over here, we are talking about emphasizing policies related to decarbonization programs. We haven't spent as much time on that with the CEC and the CPUC. Over the next few weeks, you'll actually be seeing some very exciting information around our work with large commercial customers. And we want to expand our focus on that sector too, and it's connected, so box nine and box two are also connected. Box number 10 is connected to eight. If we are talking about working electrification into our value proposition, we want to expand our digital communication and you're gonna see a phenomenal presentation from Don and Pamela later this evening on that. Number 11 is our doubling down of programs. That's another priority. Operationalizing equity into all our programs is something that gets connected to whether it's number six, seven, 10, and 11. So with that, we'll go to the next slide and tell you what the executive committee's input was. Uh, the executive committee uh, wanted to keep the mission overall measure unchanged. The 24 by seven clean energy delivery to keep that as, to really put it in context that that's an aspiration for the future. We're not gonna change our portfolio buying principles on a dime to get there, and then keeping diversity and equity focus across the enterprise, and use examples like what I just gave you as to how it's gonna be put in practice. We also had a member of the public talk about, said, great, loved all your strategic plan, but you know what, it's very board focused and staff focused, why don't you make this more customer focused? And I love the idea, but part of this is we need to be on the same page, and so there's the same document can have different perspective and lenses, and we'll work to develop a more customer-facing uh, communication, but we first need to work together with the board. Uh, then I'll go to my last slide, which is kind of a repetition of our timeline. You will be seeing uh, when Amrit talks to you about the budget, starting at the June 24th Executive Committee meeting. We'll start to weave in some of the discussion that the Executive Committee and the Board would have in our strategic focus areas and plans. And we will provide you the work plan, so you'll see that in October. With that, I'll stop my presentation, open for questions. Thank you. Um, very uh, impressive and comprehensive. Uh, introduction to a discussion uh, that the board values very much. So thank you for all of that and everyone putting it together uh, from all the departments. So thank you. Do we have questions from any of board members at the dais? Seeing none, do we have questions from any of the board members online? I don't see any hands raised. Am I missing anyone? Uh, no, Chair, no hands are raised. Okay, thank you. And with that, we will open the public um, uh, comment portion of this discussion. Are there any members of the public in the audience? None. Any members of the public online wishing to speak on this item? I see no hands raised. Confirm there are no hands raised. Thank you. And then we will bring it back uh, to the board for discussion. And uh, there's no motion on this. This is a uh, presentation and uh, discussion. So um, any thoughts for staff at this time? Okay. Uh, I'll just say that um, we did discuss this at the executive board um, and uh, appreciate how staff has uh, taken the, the information from that format into tonight's presentation to help um, explain the con con uh, consistency, the um, 
a way of taking the current goals and how they transition into continuing and then identifying what's changed to allow us to change uh, and reinforce, um, basically set up this incredible matrix of goals and objectives and uh, looking at what staff will be being asked to do. So I think it was a very good um, comprehensive uh, presentation um, and it, it made sense to me. So I thank you very much for that. If there's no other comments, we will um, take a break. And it is South says it is um, 8.41. Uh, if we come back at 8.50, is that acceptable to everyone? Okay. All right. Thank you. And please stay on this Zoom um, link.
May we reconvene, please? Rec rec recording in progress. So thank you all. I think taking a break is good for all of us uh, and it allows us to have a fresh mind as we go into additional agenda items. So I think we'll do this uh, on a regular basis going forward. Thank you. All right, we are now at item number six which is the results of the stress test analysis. This is also a discussion. It's a follow-up to some discussions we've had previously, and in, uh, our CFO and Director of Administrative Services, Amrit Singh, will make the presentation. Welcome, Amrit. Thank you, Chair Givens. Good evening, Directors. So I am going to talk about the stress test analysis. Uh, as Chair Givens mentioned, this is a discussion item. We'll go to the next slide, please, Andrea. So today, I'm actually wearing my risk management hat on. One of the one of the things that a uh, one of the best industry practices best practices is to conduct what's called, no, called enterprise-wide risk assessment, where we basically stress the business model to see what are some of the strategic risks facing the organization, and and how can we respond in an should one of these adverse events were to happen uh, so that we can continue to provide the critical and valuable services to our customers. So what we did at SVCE, we had a cross-functional team get together and brainstorm on what some of the key strategic risks are. And I'm going to go through five of those, four that I'm going to discuss now, and one that deals with threat to public services and, and facilities we'll do in a closed session. Um, and um, so I'll go through these analysis at, at a fairly high level. Uh -huh. And we've had very detailed discussion with the Finance and Administration Committee meeting uh, earlier this month where we spent close to an hour on this topic. And we also spent significant time with the Executive Committee. But today I'll provide the high level, but I'm always open to meeting anyone one-on-one uh, -on -one and go through the findings in more detail. So in terms of the presentation, I'll go through how we came up with the, the scenarios we selected, what we expected when we constructed the scenario versus the results we found, and the mid things that we're recommending to mitigate the risk. And I'll just give you a preview. Basically, the best defense for all of these uh, adverse scenarios is to hold adequate reserves. So what we will do is what you will see uh, in the budget proposal that will come before you in, in, as a preview in August will be our, an ask to basically hold higher level reserves so that we are adequately, we can adequately respond to these uh, risk factors. And we will discuss the, our proposal with the executive committee. So with that, we'll go to the next slide. So a little bit about, about stress tests or enterprise-wide risk scenarios. These are extreme cases, but they're plausible. And in other words, they can happen. And they have happened in the past. And if they were to happen, they can affect our competitive position and our ability to carry out our mission. Uh, so the reason we do this is to ensure we have adequate reserves and and organizational ability to respond to this. They can guide in our development of strategic plan that, that Rich just went over. They, as I mentioned, they will shape our budget and reserve targets. So I'm going to go through the first four right now, and the fifth scenario will join in the closed session. The, and, and these are not the only scenarios we could have come up with. There are other areas we can focus on. Uh, these are the ones we chose to prioritize at this at this point in time. In the future, when we do stress tests, we can we can pick other areas, uh, and some of those are are listed in the appendix to this presentation. So one of the first scenarios that we did, and this is very similar to the scenario presented late last year or conducted late last year, and we shared it around February time with the board. Uh, this is what it, what happens if energy prices would drop. Uh, significantly. And what that means, as you know, is that prices drop, pg e the PCIA that pg e charges our customers goes up and their rate comes down and that can reduce our revenue. So we'll look at the impact of that. The second scenario has to do with what if we run out of cash? Not just expected costs, 
but what if we have a price collapse collapse that triggers credit downgrade. One of the credit provisions we have in our contracts is uh, our ability to ask counterparties to post collateral uh, as, uh, should our exposure to them exceed certain pre-established thresholds. And likewise, they have the ability to do that for us, with us. And the contracts become in the money for them and or their exposure to us increases when prices come down and we're still obligated to pay at a higher price. They can trigger these collateral call, calls, which can be a huge draw on cash reserves. So we wanted to look at what if, what if our, we run out of cash of, of, of those conditions. And the third item here, increase in polar uh, requirements called the financial security reserve requirement. A little bit about polar. Polar stands for provider of last resort which currently for us is PG&E. In other words, if CCAs were to fail, our customers would go back to um, PG&E. And what, what PG&E and, and the commission has, has established a process where CCAs have to post financial security requirement, cover the, the cost of serving those customers before the utilities can recognize that revenue that coming in that a CCA were to were to um, not be able to continue to provide services to the customers. Currently, the way the calculation works it has resulted in very minimum requ uh, posting requirements for us. So we post about $147,000. Currently, this requirement has gone up significantly for the Southern California utilities. And there are proposals pending before the CPUC. There's a proceeding going on at the CPUC that can significantly increase this requirement for us. One of the proposals that's gaining traction collectively for Northern California uh, utilities would require posting 1.4 billion and our share under certain conditions could be like 70 million. The stress test we've modeled, what if we had to post at $35 billion? And the reason for 35 million is because we, in the stress condition, we, we're assuming prices come down, so our requirement would be lower. The third scenario, is this is something the board is familiar with, is the risk we face, uh, is what if our PPAs were to default, renegotiate for higher prices, or delay the start date? We could be facing RPS and compliance penalty, and obviously we would be facing replacement at higher market prices. The fourth scenario deals with what if we were to lose load to direct access of distributed energy resources? And what we've modeled is what if we, as a scenario, what if we lost 10% in 2025 and another 10% in 2027? And how would we, um, how, what would be the, uh, the, the financial implications to us when we have contracted for the resources and if prices were to come down? all of a sudden we get stranded resources that we have to sell in the open market at lower prices, raising costs for the remaining customers. That's that scenario. And the fifth one, as I mentioned, we'll talk in the closed session. Okay, so we'll, we'll go through at a high level the findings in the next slide. So the key finding from the stress test analysis is that in terms of financial risk facing our organization is is our sensitivity to energy prices, power market prices. And that's because of, of, of its, imp its impact on PCIA and PG&E's generation rate. So stress scenario one, price collapse, this scenario basically overwhelms all other stress factors. It's such a big driver of the risk we're facing. But what we found, and I'll, uh, there's some slides in, in coming up too, um, what we expected is that we will have significant reduction in revenues and we will have a large draw in reserves if we were to maintain our current pricing methodology, where we provide a, at least a 1% discount to our customers and, and, and be able to fund all our other operating costs. Uh, so the results were same as expected. We found that if prices were to collapse, and when we say collapse, uh, what we're saying is prices go to the from current level where they are to the one percentile level. Uh, in other words, there's only one percent chance that it could be even lower than what we're modeling. 
You might think that's an extreme case. Yes, it is an extreme from where we are. But when I show you the chart uh, coming up, you'll notice that the, the prices that we model in the stress test is very close to where prices were trading as recently as, as, as 12 months ago. And this is very plausible. And we have seen this play out in the commodity business. For example, in 2008, during the financial crisis, prices was, were very high. And with a matter of few months, they dropped significantly. And, and that's a risk we face. We, we don't expect that to happen, but it could happen. It's plausible. And it's wise for the organization to be prepared for such a, but a very plausible scenario. And again, we're talking about prices that can go to where they were as recently as 12 months ago. And what, we'll, what we found is if prices would collapse beginning in 2023, all the entire five-year forward curve comes down, the biggest impact will be in 2024 when those prices will be reflected in higher PCIA and lower pg e generation rate. And that drops our, our revenue significantly and we could have a pull on reserves of $178 million. This is a reference our reserves right now are somewhere around $150 million. We expect that to grow significantly with the way the market is shaping up on an expected basis. Um, and I'll talk about that later as well. Scenario two, what we found is that the, there is a large draw in reserves, but it's driven by scenario one impact, the price collapse. We did not face any significant collateral calls because as I said, prices, when we model the prices, they're collapsing back to where they were as close as a year ago. And a lot of our contracts are, are way in the money that it doesn't, um, it, 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 prices are even lower than that. So it doesn't, trigger the collateral calls we were, in, we were anticipating. But the biggest requirement here is the biggest impact is, a, is the price collapse impact of scenario one, coupled with the new polar requirement that we're modeling at 35 million. So this, the 178 from scenario one plus 35 million in scenario two, that's a draw of 213 million. And this is by far the most uh, consequential scenario of all these scenarios. Scenario three, again, on an expected basis, we never want this to happen. This is costly to us, but at a big high level strategic risk facing us, this is not at rise to that level. What we modeled is PPAs, when they will, if they were to default, they will be, they will hurt us more if prices were to increase because that's when we would have to replace them at a higher price. When prices increase, our revenues go up orders of magnitude it doesn't turn out to be as stressful. So instead of doing a price increase scenario, in the summary in the appendix table, we actually modeled price decrease and the scenario is better than the other scenario. But again, on an expected basis, it's costly and we want to avoid this with, with all our ability and make sure all our counterparties honor their contractual obligation. Same goes with load loss. It, it's overwhelmed by the, by the price uh, drop scenario. So when we model load loss and, and prices come down, remember we were thinking prices come down, we left the stranded cost, you have to sell at a lower price, pass that, that negative market to the rest of our customers. But that actually, what we found is that actually with the price collapse scenario, this is actually scenario four, slightly, slightly better than scenario one because our operating margins become negative and selling less of a commodity at a negative margin is helpful. So the big picture here, price collapse is, is a big risk we're facing. It's something we need to be prepared for um, as, an, as an organization. We'll go to the next slide and I'll go through these slides quickly. So just as I mentioned, the prices where they're trading at right now, these are forward prices, in other words, for future delivery of power, what market is paying right now, what they're trading at. You can see the huge run-up uh, in the last 12 months or so. And when I, uh, on the right side, I saw, show the one percentile prices that the model in the stress case, and you can see those levels are comparable to where they were in the recent past. Okay? 
So while the the scenario is is unlikely, but very plausible is what this picture is is is, is painting. We'll go to the next slide. Now, on an expected basis, base case, if we were to take the current forward prices and model how our business would look five years from now, we are seeing very healthy SVCE margin on an expected basis. Okay. But that comes with a lot of caveats here. That's if the current forward prices are actually realized in the in the spot market, in the Kaiso market, on, on come come uh, maturity of, the, of those terms. If that would happen, we would this, the stress test is modeled at a calendar year level, not at a fiscal year level. And this was done in March timeframe, and actually prices have gone up significantly since that time. So if we were to update these, these numbers would would improve, but the big picture is not going to change, the message that I'm telling you. What we're showing is that reserves could increase significantly and we'll have continued strong growth over the next five years. But the big caveats here is, this is as we have modeled PCIA and PG&E's generation rate. Again, we don't have insights into these models. There are black box boxes to us, as we've shared before, and they're We've modeled them as best using new gen consultant, Cal CCA consultants, and we found their model to be very good indicator. Of course, they cannot accurately predict. You have to have the insights into PG&E's portfolio of both PCIA and Generate. But directionally, they give us good indication. PG&E's portfolio management strategy may change than those assumed in the model. And of course, the CPUC has the ultimate say what the rates are. So even if the model rates are higher, PG's costs are higher, the CPC may moderate rate impacts. And the numbers that I've shown in the appendix and in the staff report, they're uncertain. And, and the further out in time you go, five years, their they're uncertainty increases. But the focus here is on the delta of the base case, the stress case. That is very relevant. Not so much on the absolute level of these, these, uh, these numbers. So again, just to reiterate scenario two, is the one that's going to hurt the most, you know, where we get the huge draw on reserves from the price clap, collapse, but potential substantial increase on our financial security reserve requirement. And if that were to happen, you can see that in in in, in starting years 2025, our days of cash on hand drop significantly below our minimum target of 120 days. Okay. So on the next slide, let's talk about mitigations. The best mitigation is to hold sufficient financial reserves. We have the opportunity. So when we get a good year like we're getting this year, we have to remember if markets turn, that that can go away in the future year. You cannot bank current year's margin. It, it, you have to have at least a two-year horizon of looking at, at, at our financial portfolio. So what we will do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is we will propose reserve targets using the stress test analysis, which we will model for the fiscal year, uh, based, uh, you know, you know, our fiscal year uh, months, and then once we we will present that to the executive committee uh, at the June 24th meeting, then we'll run it by the finance and admin committee before we share it with the board in August and solicit board's feedback. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take all that feedback and, and submit the final budget in, in September. But once we set the reserve target, that will then determine how much discretionary funding we have for additional customer discounts we want to provide, as well as any other funding we want to do for our decarbonization efforts. The other risk mitigation strategy that we're looking at, and this is very complicated, but we're doing a lot of analysis, and it's focus area for us is looking at our hedging strategy. So one of the things you can expect is when prices collapse, you may be asking, well, isn't that good for us? Our buy power at a lower cost. But remember, we have a very active hedging program, which is helping help our financial situation to date very well. But that means when prices collapse, our cost doesn't go down uh, by the same, you know, commensurately or, or uh, in a commensurate manner, because we're locked into these these 
prices for our hedging program and for our long-term car purchase agreements. Uh, one of the things we could look at is what if we were to change that hedging strategy, but there are a lot of implications for that and we want to we want to go through it in a very thoughtful, careful manner. The big challenge here is not knowing the PCIA and the PG&E generate. We know they have an impact uh, on our on our business risk because of the of the risk they pose on the revenue side, which we can mitigate the power supply side. But what that direct relationship is very difficult to model without having. Detail insights in ECI and PG gen rates. And, and any changes will all obviously increase the volatility in our power supply costs and, and budget. And the next slide, I'm just going to summarize the process I talked about. So at the June 24th meeting, again, we will pose what we think we should target for our reserve level. It is going to be at higher level because of the risk we're facing. Um, then we will present this to the Finance and Administration Committee before the August 10 meeting. I don't have an exact date because I'm still nailing the date with the committee members. Then we'll discuss it at the August 10 board meeting, take the board's feedback, and hopefully when we come in September, the board is, we've reflected all the comments and, 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 and that's reflected in the, in the budget that will be approved by the board. And that's our normal process. Any questions? I know I went through that early quickly. There's a lot of information in the appendix as well as the staff report. Uh, thank you, Amrit. Uh, very, very important uh, discussion that we've been building on. And I know I didn't understand what stress tests were until there was the bank problem in 2008. So I now appreciate the value of what we're doing um, here. So thank you for all of that hard work. We will go to questions from the board here first. Um, Vice Chair. Tyson. Yes, Tyson. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, thanks again for the presentation. I think every time I see it, I get a new level of uh, understanding, which is a helpful thing. Um, one thing that strikes me is that one of the things we hold dear is our 1% reduction over PG&E costs. And, and that's, you could tell that was important to us because this last year the prices went, went up and we, we suffered a, a deficit. And so uh, we, we did that to hold to that. But I, I would just say, Amrit, in terms of, I guess this isn't a question, maybe it's a, yeah, it's sort of, I'll turn it into a question. <laughs> I'd be interested to know in the event of price collapse where suddenly everybody's seeing much lower costs <coughs> that we switch our philosophy and what if we went to 1% above PG&E, would that make much difference? That'd be my question. And then, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, before you answer, if you are going to answer, I'll say my observation is I firmly support this idea of reserves. You know, when we build dams, we're not creating more water, are we? We're just getting more water when we have a lot so that we can use it when we don't. And that's what I, I feel is your strategy with reserves, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I will attempt to an answer. Um, yes. We've modeled the 1% in the stress test scenarios, um, but the board always has the right. So this is where we wanna, when we set the minimum target, um, we wanna set what is the right, we'll do a, a, a target level that we should be targeting reserves at. But then the way we're thinking about, about is if the stress test were to occur, like scenario two were to occur, let's not dip below the minimum 120 days. But that gives us enough time to react to change in strategy, whether that be a rate strategy. Come back to have detailed discussions with the board, with the committees, say, should we go above? And some CCAs have gone above and, and still maintain high participation rates. Of course, we have very price sensitive customers because we have a large CNI customer base. We have to be careful with that. But that's one of the reasons we will make sure that we want to not dip below the 120 days. So we can frame, we have time to frame the strategy. We have time to go to the banks and, and negotiate any lines of credit we may want. So that would be factored in in how we'll propose a reserve target. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Tyson. 
no other questions from the board here. Uh, we'll go to our uh, online panelists, and I have a raised hand from Director Alahi. And if there's anyone else, please be sure and raise your hand. Uh, thank you, Amrit, for the presentation. I know it's a very complicated task to do risk assessments, and you guys have done, done an excellent job. Um, I, 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 I would suggest that as you do your assessment and analysis and what could go wrong and what could go right, uh, maybe, maybe a solution should also be put in there, if possible, that if this happens, this is what we're going to do. You know, obviously, the solution might be, okay, we're going to have staff cuts, or we're going to hire consultants, or we'll do something else. So I'd, I'd let you guys figure it out, since you are the uh, real experts on this, uh, as far as I can tell. But I would, I would think another column outlining what would the uh, you might do, and, and some of it might have to be kept confidential at this time. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be all disclosed, so use your discretion on that. But that would be my thought. I'll just add that there is some discussion of that in the appendices where we go through each of the scenarios and we say what the additional mitigations could be. At the high level, the mitigation is to hold reserves. and But we also talk about some of the other things we could do in some of these scenarios. Okay, that's great. Yeah, the reserves obviously is a, is a uh, easy one, but the, those reserves, yeah. reserves are going to go away very, very fast if yeah. things you know, go out and go south. All right. Thank you, Director Alahi. I see no other raised hands from the board. With that, we will go to the uh, public for public comment on this item. Do we have any comments, calls from the public? I see none from the audience here and none from online. Uh, yes, Chair, I can confirm there are no raised hands. Good. All right. Uh, thank you. We will now bring the discussion back to the board. And um, I would, so this is a discussion. There is no action. But I think um, what, I, what I took away from this, as I was saying, is understanding what uh, stress tests, the significance and the, the value of stress tests. Uh, and as we grow and as our uh, revenues grow and as our clients um, and obligations grow and we start taking on the PPAs, um, a stress test analysis is, is extremely uh, appropriate and essential to uh, protecting the organization. But what I also um, uh, learned after seeing this presentation, I think three times, um, is it is a new way of looking at the decision about reserves and our rates. But prior to this, I mean, it seems like we really were being somewhat subjective. We were really trying to say, well, we can put this much over here and we can put this much over here and does this make sense for these rates? But now we have, I'm gonna call it 180 degree turn on having a real structure to understanding how we should set our reserves. Um, and that was, um, I think, very interesting for me. I don't know what others thought. Is there any other comment from the board members here? Seeing none, uh, any discussion, comments from our attendees from the board? Well, you've done an excellent job explaining a very complicated and significant issue, and I think we'll look forward to uh, your presentations in um, August um, and September. And also, I do encourage um, those who have any individual questions to feel free to contact uh, Amrit and or look at the appendices. Um, there's a lot of information uh, there and a detailed breakout of how the stress test uh, was developed and the conclusions um, brought um, to this discussion. Uh, Chair, we do have a raised hand from Director Martinez Beltran. Oh, you know, okay, thank you. Martinez, uh, Director Martinez Beltran, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly comment. I, I want to keep the meeting going, but Amrit and, and the team, thank you very much for bringing this to the board. I really appreciated hearing this in the executive committee. I think that it gives lots of insight into where we want to be and what we want to do with our reserves. Um, and often I think that's one of the questions is elected as your electeds looking at, you know, at the budget and looking at what we're preparing for understanding the lens or the perspective that you're looking at the situation from as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any further comments before we move on? 
Seeing none, thank you. We have two items uh, remaining. It's now 9.30, so uh, we will uh, move to item number seven, an update on the digital engagement uh, initiatives and spring 2023 Silicon Valley Clean Eddy Energy Electrification Awareness Survey results. This is a presentation by Don Bray. I've been, I think we've been told this is gonna be exciting. <laughs> and um, also Pamela Leonard, our communications manager. Please. Always easy to follow a stress test presentation with, with something exciting. Um, thank you, Chair, and, and uh, good evening, directors. Uh, a big challenge for SVCE as a uh, small and still relatively new organization is uh, how do we best engage with 270,000 customers across 13 communities? Um, in you know, our, our of course, our focus is electrification and decarbonization. These are new concepts for most people. Uh, how do we explain what that is? How do we motivate and educate and enable action among our customers as it relates to electrification? Um, stepping back one level, how do we continue to grow awareness of who SVCE is um, and our services, our uh, resources, our programs, uh, and the like? Uh, people tend to engage with organizations that they know and that they trust. So continuing to uh, expand awareness of SVC, SVC's profile in the community is just super important uh, to our, our long-term mission. We've worked really hard over the last 18 months to significantly expand our digital outreach capabilities and our online resources in an effort to uh, to grow our, our profile uh, in the community among our customers. Uh, Pam is going to take you through uh, the details. Uh, she'll talk about uh, our accomplishments and, and some of our lessons learned uh, along the way. Uh, she'll also share the results of uh, the recent uh, survey that, uh, that Chair Gibbons mentioned uh, that I think you'll find interesting. And hopefully we'll have a, a few minutes left at the end for, uh, for some questions. Um, Pam, uh, over to you. All right, thanks for kicking it off, Don. Uh, so as Don went over the purpose of, of this uh, presentation, so I will skip over this slide and dive right in, as I know I have a limited time and I need to be controlled because my excitement for this subject is quite high. Uh, so we, as background, um, Garish had talked about the strategic plan earlier and in, a couple years ago, we decided to shift a focus on this digital pivot because we can reach more customers more effectively at a low cost. Uh, we do have a significant number of customer email addresses on file, and so we wanted to really think about how we could leverage that. And the timing couldn't have been better, uh, you know, silver lining with everything we've been through over the past few years, um, but we were already preparing to really focus on digital engagement efforts ahead of um, the pandemic. And so we, you know, were fortunate to have put a lot of new tools and resources, or we're in the process of launching these um, ahead of 2020, and that includes our eHub, which you're familiar with, um, our list of resources there for electrification, education, and awareness. We got an email marketing service, Gov Delivery, that allows us as a public agency to um, more effectively deliver communications to customers electronically. And then we did um, a lot of reworking of our website to shift our focus away from our basic offering of, hey, we're here, we're your community choice energy provider, to really trying to inspire and encourage customers to electrify. So that's sort of the, the this is showing the basis of our approach to our um, electrification education, is we wanted to first inspire customers to want to care about electrification. What is this? Why should you care about clean energy and um, you know the constant need to draw awareness to our new agency? We're up against you know 100 plus years of history of a different utility that everyone is aware of and still receives bills for. Uh, so lots of work to be done there. And then we need to educate our customers so they understand the benefits and the importance of electrification and then we want to give them the tools and resources that enable action. How can they actually make purchases, get rebates, utilize our programs? And that's this is sort of the, the funnel that we've structured our um, awareness and campaigns around. So some results. Um, very excited to just show 
key takeaway here is website usage was up 280% when we uh, started implementing our email marketing campaigns. Um, it was a lot of, we built something, we have to then drive traffic to get people to go there. So we did a lot of um, advertising out of home. There were some great, you know, there was uh, some discounts on out of home, like bus shelter ads when people weren't commuting as much, but definitely still in high visibility areas as people go to the grocery store and what have you. Um, and we also worked with our member communities. They've been, um, your PIOs and other staff have been uh, very helpful in helping to push out these resources to your um, constituents. And um, we also wanted to take a look at, has the way we've structured this information been useful? So while we've seen great engagement, we've seen um, an increase in traffic to the site, we did do user testing to really look at, is the navigation something that makes sense? Um, what improvements can we make to the way the information is presented? Um, so that's something that we have the results for and we're gonna be making some improvements based on this user feedback um, over the coming year. We had a goal of reaching 20,000 unique users. Um, far exceeded that with 74,000 in our first year of launching eHub because we had done some work trying to research benchmarks for other utilities. But what we found is no one else has put together a set of resources the way that we have, or they haven't packaged it in a way that we have, or they didn't have access to customers or the same challenges being um, a community choice aggregator. And so it was really hard to, to find a benchmark. So we just put a number out there, really exceeded it. So for this fiscal year, we, we gave ourselves a stretch goal. So we're really working hard to try to see if we can go to 200,000 users. So we'll work working towards that. And we, not only are we just measuring that people have come and looked at the site, but are they really engaging with the content? And the best way to do that was measuring the average time on page Industry standard is less than a minute that people will look at a web page. Can't really consume too much information in that amount of time. But with these numbers of two to three minutes, customers, that does show that they're really reading the content and engaging with the information we're providing. So email campaigns uh, uh, also far exceeded our, our goal for our first year. I think we were dipping our toe in the water a little bit, but went above and beyond. So we said we would send out a million outbound emails. We did over two million. This year, our goal was to do two million, and uh, you can see we're almost at four, or so we've really uh, done a lot of um, emails. So this is, if we send out one mass um, residential email blast, that goes to about 180,000 customers. Um, and these are educational, right? This, the way we frame the information is about providing resources to the community. We're not trying to sell things, right? We're, we're trying to inspire, enable action, um, all those other things I um, talked about. And um, just for comparison, um, industry standard for open rates on email are usually around 22%. Our average open rate's 35. We've seen some of our campaigns deliver as high as 50 to 60% open rates. So if you think about that, you know, for the 180,000 recipients, it's amazing what kind of reach we're getting with the click of a button. And then we're learning a lot too. So we found that emails need to be simple, not too much information, easy to understand. Video have performed really well. If we link to a video, people really do click on those and watch them. And we do A-B testing to understand what kind of subject lines um, get people to open emails. And we do offer a lot of the email campaigns that people can click and open and read the content in other languages, which then increases traffic um, to our uh, translated sites. So with eHub, we have a lot of really cool tools and tricks and tactics we can deploy to engage with our customers. We've been running online promotions for um, energy efficient electric products. Uh, we started out with um, doing like a modest, let's just see how this goes with some LED light bulbs and smart power strips and got to experience what that was like. But then when we did our portable induction cooktop, the first rebate, we far exceeded expectations. 
Um, I know we beat whatever goal we had had in mind. I think we're like, oh, if we sell like 50 of these, that'd be cool. But we sold over 200 um, by sell. It's rebates processed, um, which was a $50 rebate for, for folks who get a cooktop. Um, learned things like smart light bulbs were not interesting. So you can see that one didn't go so well. Uh, and then last summer, in light of summer readiness, um, PSPS events, wildfires, heat, we did a summer resilience promotion with air purifiers, portable electric batteries, and evaporative coolers. We're looking to bring back that kind of promotion this summer as well, because um, we know cooling is really something that folks need um, in this area as it gets warmer. And um, induction cooktops, we ran that promotion again this year, and it we processed over 500 rebates, I believe. Uh, so it really um, is incredible to see the kind of interest and demand uh, that our customers are having in trying out these technologies. So each of, every time we run one of these promotions, it's promoted via email in a way that's about, you know, check it out, here are the benefits. And um, we also do something cool with sweepstakes. So customers can take actions that drive them to our different educational resources. So you can enter a sweepstakes, click here to learn about EVs, click here to learn about induction cooking, or click here to learn about heat pumps. And every time they take one of those actions, or maybe it's sign up for our newsletter, um, they get additional entries. We do a random drawing. We had some awesome prizes in uh, our Earth Day sweepstakes for um, this past April. And we had done this um, last summer as well and saw that it was a really effective way to drive more engagement and users to our site. And we have the solar and battery assistant. So this is the online no obligation concierge service that customers can utilize where they can speak to a third party independent energy advisor. This company, um, it's uh, Electrum. They do the system sizing for people's homes and analyze their usage. So you're not necessarily having to speak, or customers don't have to speak to a single company and try to give that information to multiple installers and get multiple bids. They can just do that all in one place. Um, so you can see here that we've um, generated some pretty good leads and have actually um, had some sales. And we do have a, a $1,000 off panel upgrade um, rebate available through if anyone who uses the service and installs a battery. So moving on to the customer awareness survey. So we first launched a survey uh, last fall, or fall 2020 actually, before we wanted to do a baseline awareness um, level setting ahead of all the, the big marketing that we were gonna be doing um, launching eHub. We hadn't done an awareness survey before, and then another component of this was also measuring electrification awareness and interest in adopting electric appliances. So we had shared those results when we did that, and then we did the follow-up survey um, more recently this spring, and it was done by phone. We got this many responses, um, and email, I should say, phone and email, multiple languages. And like last time, we are analyzing the results by the Socioeconomic Vulnerability Index quartiles. So that is the, by census tracts, um, customers are grouped into these quartiles with SEVI 1 being most well off, SEVI 4 being um, not as well off. Uh, and that's an interesting way for us to look at how we could potentially um, market or adjust our messaging and do marketing to different groups in, with customers that have different socioeconomic um, backgrounds. Uh, we, one, one thing we did not do in uh, the 2020 survey is we didn't do an unaided recall of our awareness. The question was just, have you heard of Silicon Valley Clean Energy? And the results were 70%, and I was like, my job here is done. Thank you very much. Uh, but we really wanted to know. We wanted to know the honest truth. Um, and so what you can see is the unaided recall was just 10% of respondents. Like, who provides your electricity? As you can imagine, overwhelming response, PG&E. So that just goes to show we have a lot of work to do and we need to continue to do to dif dif differentiate ourselves as an agency and increase customer awareness. But then once prompted, we did see a lift. So 73% of people did say, oh yes, I've heard of them. 
And um, we also saw kind of from the other results of our own analytics that there was a significant increase in um, folks who had visited our website. So that was good. Cost and health are the most important um, factors in making purchasing decisions. So this is where we get into really asking questions about um, electrification considerations that customers have. And um, this is going to be helpful for us to keep in mind as we draft messaging and create marketing campaigns for our expanded program offers. And um, that there's a, a difference in the SEVI quartiles for um, those who care more about cost. And so uh, it, it's just really helpful for us to think about as we approach different customer segments. Uh, this one was also interesting. Um, Concerns about fossil fuel use was lower than in 2020. We do have a hypothesis out there as to why that may be. The timing of the 2020 survey was right after um, orange skies and power outages and um, folks really feeling uh, effects of climate change. And this year, um, there was just a lot of current events happening. Uh, as, as you all are aware of uh, over the last several months. And so they think that that has um, potentially affected the, the um, attitudes here. Um, so just wanted to keep that in mind as we think about how we talk about the benefits of, of electrification and maybe not necessarily leading with uh, reducing fossil fuels. Again, thinking about the other messaging about cost and health benefits. And um, finally, the survey um, is giving us some insight into customers' level of interest in various electric technologies and uh, barriers to adoption. So we can see that there's um, some kind of top barriers identified for each. Um, one thing to note with EVs, we do see a difference in SEVI quartile, for example, with access to uh, charging. So where do you park your vehicle? Do you have, is, there, is it near an outlet? Um, so those kinds of insights are just really helpful for us to check in on and think about how we can use that information to try to see how we address those barriers with our programs or how we discuss and market those programs. And that is my presentation. Okay. <laughs> uh, fantastic and yes, exciting as the uh, preliminary indications would be. Uh, thank you so, so much. Uh, all right, do we have any questions um, of the presentation from members on the board here? Director Flygor. Thank you, Chair, and just to echo what Liz just said, Pamela, excellent presentation. We got excited as you are, um, <laughs> you know, hearing about um, the customer experience and how we can improve on it is so important. It goes back to the public comment um, that was mentioned earlier about really looking at the customer's perspective. So thank you so much for all this work. Just a couple of questions. One um, with the website user data. I'm curious because part of this or one of the primary purposes is to educate. And I wonder if there are ways to measure the conversion. So we're educating, people are learning about the benefits of electrification and SVCE, but is there a way to measure that they're actually converting um, to the things they're learning, electrical appliances, switching to SVCE if they're not already a member, and things like that. Um, yeah, to address that, that is one of the big questions that we've had come up as we created the, the metrics we're using to evaluate these tools. It is really difficult to say if someone learns about electric vehicles from one of our email campaigns or uses our EV assistant to do some shopping and comparison. We can't really know if two years down the road when it's time for a new car they go buy an EV and if we were you know, so our, our hope is, you know, otherwise, if it's tools where there's a, a rebate that we know for sure we can track that rebate, or if um, some of our programs where there's rebates that may not be um, processed through the eHub tools, like um, the heat pump water heater program, for example, um, I think there's ways that we could retroactively survey program participants and hear how they've learned about those programs. Um, there are some questions in the survey that do say, do you use the SV, like where do you get information about the following? And we do 
um, in that can see, do they come to the SVCE website for information or not? Or do they use some other resources, word of mouth? Um, and that's what our hope is to measure that year over year as we do the survey annually and try to then, once we have more data, see if there is an increase or a lift. So we're, we're trying to figure out a way to find that out. Right, no, great. And then with the new, the unique users, that huge increase, are we able to track which cities we have users? So for example, I don't know if you're able to get that data, the address, um, and to figure out are these from Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, Cupertino, Sunnyvale, do we know where these users are um, located? I, I want to say yes, and my team will have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that Google Analytics does show IP address location. Um, so that is something that we can look into. I'd be curious. We had um, our first community engagement meeting two days ago um, on reach codes. And Tony from um, the SVCE staff was there as well with them, Los Altos employees. And it was interesting that I would say 50% of the questions had nothing to do with reach codes. <laughs> and I wish I had piped up and said, please go to the eHub <laughs> on the SVCE website, because I think it would have answered a lot of the questions they had. Um, and the last question I have for you, Pamela, just has to do with the question about when you do the unaided recall question of who provides um, your energy and they are not able to come up with SVCE, I wonder if as part of the survey, people were, were associating SVCE as a subset of PG&E because it's one bill. So I actually wonder if people think SVC is, is part of PG&E as opposed to its own separate entity. Did you hear any of that in the survey? So we included um, the full summary of findings as an attachment um, to this item, and that is a question we do ask. And so it's like, what is SVCE? It's a government agency. It's a part of PG&E. People don't associate us as part of PG&E for don't. the most case. Right. Okay. Yes. They, um, I forget. I think they pretty much get it if they <laughs> answered that question, uh, that we're our own um, uh, entity. Um, but that, that is one of the questions we do ask. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the dais? Uh, seeing none, are there any questions from um, the board members uh, online? And I'm specifically looking at uh, Director Martinez Beltran. <laughs> I always miss your hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, seeing none, um, I'll just offer that um, I think this is great information because um, this outreach, and we've always, from the very, very, very beginning, have wanted to know how to communicate with our customers, how to engage our customers, and to have this information being tracked over a period of time, setting our new goals, challenging ourselves to new ways of uh, outreach, um, I think is really important to our business. And I think uh, a willingness to learn this information and challenge ourselves is, is very, very um, helpful. So thank you, Pam, to you. Um, and your staff, and I would say that those of us, because I always say we are an elected board, we're elected officials, we understand what analytics are. We understand what you know time spent on a page, getting people to even go, and how do you keep them there, um, makes a lot of sense to us. So um, thank you for the valuable information, and, and uh, great work, keep it up. <laughs> thank you. All right. We have one item, it is now 10 minutes of 10. We do have a long agenda tonight, so thank you for everyone hanging in there. Uh, we'll go through this presentation on the REACH code update, and the presentation will be by Zoe Elizabeth, uh, the Deputy Director of Decarbonization Programs and Policies. Good evening, everyone. I got the hardest uh, position in the agenda going after the communications team. <laughs> um, but luck, <laughs> just before the social meeting, but luckily I am as excited about reach codes as Pam is about marketing. And it's reach code season. We aren't gonna see you all next month. We wanna make sure you get the, the status update on everything that happened this past month and the key things coming up. Um, next slide, please. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give a quick status update and then answer one of the most frequently asked questions we get recently, which is why is our 2022 model code all electric? Next slide. 
Um, okay, so this um, chart may look familiar to you all from last month. Those um, five X's that are highlighted are things that have um, updates that have happened, additional activities that have, have happened this, that have happened this past month. Um, we're supporting outreach in Los Altos and Los Gatos in addition to the other jurisdictions. Um, and TRC is now providing direct support in Gilroy, Los Altos, and Los Altos Hills. We're at Wednesday. I believe we had had three public meetings already this week. Um, Tony was at all all three of those. It's the reason he's actually not here this evening. He was um, attending a, a public meeting in Los Altos. Um, it, this summer and then next um, June and July, the key priorities to be thinking about are community engagement. If there are changes that you are making to your reach code, if you're extending that reach or thinking about um, reducing some exceptions or making any changes and you want to do that community outreach, now is, is really the time. And of course, we are here to help you. Um, holding those council information sessions. Uh, we have our second coming up in Gilroy on June 20th. Um, and again, we and TRC are there to help and support um, with those um, and any additional meetings that, that um, come up. But community engagement, council information sessions are the order of the day for the rest of June and July. Next slide, please. Um, and then uh, the last tidbit that I will leave you with here, here are the three reasons that our 2022 model code is all electric. Those of you who were with us during the 2019 code cycle, you may remember that we started what, with what we call an electric preferred um, model code, which was a code that basically helped to tilt the scales towards um, <clears throat> all electric, but didn't require all electric. This year, we've learned a lot, and the code that we're starting with um, the model code, of course, any jurisdiction can um, amend or tailor it to your specific needs. But where we're starting is at all electric. And the reasons for that is threefold. First, um, all electric is really required to meaningfully exceed the 2022 California code, which goes much further than the 2019 code did in promoting um, electric. Um, two, we've learned since 2019 that any gas appliance is really reliant on a leaky gas di distribution system. So there is research that's been done that's actually demonstrated in many jurisdictions across the country that the leaks in the gas system can be twice that what we, re what we thought before. That just came out in 2020. So we understand that even small appliances like a stove or comfort appliances, they rely on that leaky distribution system that's also costly to, of course, um, maintain and build, for, particularly for small end uses. Um, and then third, any gas appliances will soon become stranded assets, which we will then come before you to talk about building programs for to invest in and create incentives for. Um, if we're talking about in installing new heat pump water heaters in several years, we're then going to need to have, or, sorry, installing gas water heaters um, or gas ranges. Well, that we would then have to go and remove those in the future and have an uh, extensive program to do that. We want to make the best. Um, decisions now to help really future-proof your communities for the long term. And so this is why we started this year with the 2022 code being all electric. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions now, um, but I'm also happy to take any questions um, offline as needed. That's my presentation. Well, you are clearly excited, and you've set a big target. <laughs> uh, and the participation um, and actions with our various um, community engagement and council uh, outreach has been great, and I'm, I'm sure there will be lots more of it. Is there any question about what's going on, any question that could be answered this evening um, as to next steps for your city, any lessons learned that would be helpful from anyone to share? I see nothing uh, from the dais, and uh, is there any comment, question, from uh, the members of the board online? I see no hands raised. Okay. And if that's the case, um, we are uh, going to go to the public, and there is no comment from the public here in the uh, chambers. And I see no raised hands from any of our attendees. So with that, we will bring it back to the uh, board. 
for any final comments, uh, as this is a discussion item. Seeing none, uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Zoe and your team um, of reaching out, and um, I'm looking forward to having you come to Campbell soon. Uh, uh, we look forward to it as well. <laughs> first, first priority. We're next on the <laughs> list. And uh, with that, um, we will now move to the um, opportunity for board members to make any announcements and direction on future agenda items. And Director Chua, I believe you have um, a, a request to introduce a video on advanced power strips. And I think staff is going to be helpful in providing that via Zoom. Oh, sure. Our, I, I, I didn't know it was tonight. No, but it's ready anyway. Is it ready, Andrea? Uh, yes, we'll get that pulled up. Oh, great. Uh, so I got, uh, oh, we can start. Just a moment while we work through some technical It's difficulties. less than a minute. It's the APS is the advanced power strip. So this is to reduce the vampire load. I, you probably, everybody probably knows about vampire load. And, and I got the college students at Santa Cruz University to do this video and they had fun doing it. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of this is to, like you said, to to inspire, educate, and enable, and take action, hopefully. And uh, so I got some grant, uh, and we bought some uh, APS, and we've been distributing it uh, to a few people. Mm. So we're doing a pilot project on that big one. Here you go. Vampires are devices that use energy even when they're turned off. The power meter measures how much energy is being used when the device is off. As you can see here, the coffee maker is plugged in but turned off and it is using 0.8 watts. This is a plug load advanced power strip. The always on outlet refers to devices that are meant to be kept on all the time. The control outlet refers to devices that we turn on and off after each use like a TV. An energy saving outlet refers to devices that only needs to be on when the control devices is on like speakers as they wait. Here's a quick demo on how the strip works. When the control device is turned on, the vampires also turn on. When the control device is turned off, the vampires also turned off. Vampires are plugged in energy saving outlet to prevent wasted energy standby use. Here are some examples of devices with high vampire load. So, so that's it. So we're trying to, we're getting a good feedback from people that uh, yeah. we gave away the APS. So my goal is to get more grant and give away more. My goal is to have at least uh, it's a, it's a large, it's a big goal. Like I want to have like 8,000 of these in, we have 25,000 households in Milpita. So I don't know if I can reach that maybe in four years I can. So anyway, so it's really exciting. And I hope you guys can do something in your cities. It's absolutely spectacular, <laughs> aspirational and um, copycat. I think we can all. <laughs> I think we can all uh, take advantage of that lesson learned. And uh, are you going to share that video with us? May we ask Andrea oh, yeah. to share it with us? Yes. Yeah. So my goal first is to give it away to all the commissioners, since they are the oh, are led on to to the community. So I got another grant because it costs about a thousand dollars. You get 
how many you get? 80, 80 of them. So it's it's twelve dollars and fifty cents each one of those. Okay. So my goal really is eight thousand. I mean, this is a, it's a big goal, but we have to start big. What can I say? Okay. Thank you. I hope you get something out of it, and please use the video. Thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you for sharing. If there are no comments, we will now go to the public comment session uh, on the closed session. The public may provide comments regarding the closed session item just prior to the board beginning the closed session. Closed sessions are not open to the public. We will um, see if there are any comments from the public. I don't see any. And uh, Okay, um, and with that, may I remind everyone that we're going to close out of this Zoom meeting. You received a separate invite with a Zoom invitation to the closed session. And then please know that we're going to end the closed session and come back to this meeting and use this Zoom link to announce anything appropriate um, from the closed session and then close this meeting for we need a quorum for that and then we will go to the special meeting where you can stay on the current zoom uh meeting link okay so we'll probably take us two or three minutes to transition if anybody needs i think andrea just sent out a a, a new link for everybody to make sure you have the closed session link and we'll see you in a few minutes Thank you.
directly from here. Let's see, who do we have signed in? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, do we have everybody signed back in? Mm, doesn't appear to be so. So who, do, who are we missing? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, We're ten. Javid. We're missing three. We're missing Javed. Margaret dropped out. Okay. So that's eleven. So Javed and then one other. We have a quorum. Correct. So we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Proceed. So uh, what we're going to do, um, sorry, it, we were trying to make this simple and I may have complicated it. So first and foremost, um, we are uh, re-engaging um, uh, with our original board meeting of um, June 8th. We had a closed door session. There is nothing to report out from the closed door session. And with that, we will close this regular meeting of the Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board. Thank you to our public. We will now ask the board to move into a special meeting, which is also a closed door meeting. And Andrea, correct me, are we to go back to the closed door meeting Zoom link that we just finished with? Correct, you will return to the same closed link, closed session link um, as previous. Okay, and I believe you sent that out again to everyone just now. I did not, but I can. Why don't you do that? Okay. Just to make everyone's life easy at 10.30 at night. Will do. Uh, okay, so thank you all for your patience and we will go back to a special meeting, which is a closed door meeting. And I believe I have to ask if there's any comment on the special meeting, um, closed door meeting, before we go to that meeting. There's no one here commenting, and I believe there's no one online commenting. And with that, we will uh, move to the, adjourn to the closed door meeting. Thank you. And we will come back here and uh, report out the, any decisions made at that meeting. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we are reconvening the special meeting of Silicon Valley Clean Energy, and we are bringing board members uh, back after the special uh, meeting closed session for a quorum to report out. Can we confirm we have a quorum? Yes. Yes, we do. All right, thank I you. I can confirm we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, there is nothing to report out from our closed session. I thank you all for your patience and staff support, and we will adjourn this special meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much.